yours. Okay. Okay, so let's wait for a few more minutes. We have many people registered, uh, so I think we can wait for a couple of minutes to see if more people join. Is Ranjod here or not yet? I don't see him yet. Uh, yeah. Hi, George. It's nice to see people where they really live <laughs> or the way they really live. <laughs> this is also fiction, George. This is uh, outside the frame. <laughs> oh, I know, it's terribly revealing. A lot of things could could be out of the frame. I try to I try to just sit against a, a white wall <laughs> to reveal nothing. <laughs> Did you see your cat the other day? So oh, well, one of them's here under the, underneath the blanket, mm -hmm. and the other one I think is on the third on the third floor underneath the blanket in a bed. <laughs> she gets under the blanket and then flattens herself like a pancake, so nobody can see her. <laughs> I'd seen her this morning, so I think that's where she is. I think Ranjot is here. Great. I mean, we could we could start. Um, hi, Ranjot. Um, and, you know, if people follow the pattern from the past couple of days, I think they will start dropping in like 15 minutes late or something. But yeah, we usually have like a good number of people like. So, yeah, Daniel, do yeah, you maybe, have... maybe we can we can start with, with, with some. Well, first of all, welcome again to our uh, final day uh, in the digital uh, visual material symposium. Um, and, Theora will speak in a moment about the, the session, today's session, and how we are moving from structures to processes. I wanted to, to, to mention a couple of things that, that we were just discussing with Theora about, about yesterday's session and, and how things may start to connect and, and to, or to continue to connect with the ideas that we've been um, sort of circulating uh, in, in the sessions. Um, in yesterday's session, focusing on structures, um, for example, in Alma's presentation, we saw mid-century affinities between mathematics and the arts around the concept of structure um, and, and showed how mathematicians in the 70s used computer graphics to enliven topological visions and offered perception itself as a subject of mathematical investigation. Um, in Ana Maria's session in Maria's presentation, we looked at cybernetic and procedural understandings of design in the context of the um, of uh, HFG in UM, um, with the material specificity of physical artifacts is sort of reconciled with procedural descriptions that start to speak also the organizational structure of the school itself. So computational ideas and, and, and methods start to kind of occupy other spaces and, and that's been sort of a constant to many of the sessions. I think in Moa's presentation, we also learned about how the digitization of map making practices in the context of the experimental cartography unit in London showed how those processes of digitization as never, are never as seamless as 
as they as they seem at first or as they are presented, um, and that in fact the transition between hand drawn and digital map making in the UK in this context was not quick. It wasn't smooth or financially sensible at first, and I think that tells us something about the something that that we were also just chatting with the other the question of, of technological narratives uh, and how they presented. How, how successes or failures are represented in, in technological, well, in stories that we tell about technology. And I think a lot of the symposium is also asking that question, how are these systems narrated and, and how should we as scholars, uh, as practitioners, and as um, uh, people who write and think about these things may think about the, these intersections between computation and, and, and design and the practices that they support. Um, I wanted to just say a couple of, of words about the afternoon sessions, which were so interesting and, and also extending in these lines of, of thinking, um, like in conversation with, with Fiodora Frieder, Nake and Leslie Massey reflected on their encounters with computers. Uh, we were exposed to some interesting ideas, very contrasting ideas compared to what we saw in the previous sessions. I'm thinking also or perhaps particularly about George's uh, session, where the notion of control or co controlling the machine becomes the, 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 the poetic device, let's say, um, in the context of Frieder Nake's uh, work and uh, in some of the work that Leslie um, and his lab in Toronto developed, where geometry, representation, and, and, and text are sort of thematized um, and the discretization of, of of, of these elements becomes a, a sort of kind of creative engagement with or, or material engagement with with, uh, with the computer. And I think also interesting in the context of that session was hinting at the political sensibilities at play in, in early in these early moments of computer art where notions of openness and unpredictability seem to be contraposed to a different uh, aesthetic and political sensibility, uh, more monolithic or 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 more emo emotionally uh, invested, as uh, following on Frieder Nakas Nakas point, and um, I think that the session yesterday closed with a conversation that also kind of helped us see another side of the, of those questions of those political sensibilities, a very different institutional context, the context of MIT in the seventies an institution heavily funded by the US government, a laboratory that mobilized these ideas of participation and democracy in the context of computer aided uh, and computational design and art um, and urbanism and interaction, right? And, um, and how those notions were mobilized in a different way. And, and I think that opened a lot of interesting possibilities for, for, for further analysis. It also helped us think about the scholarship that exists, so these these places where um, a, how may we kind of paint these pictures, paint the picture of those moments with with, with in a more enriched enriched way. And and I think Rachel's film finger film is for us an, an, an interesting example of that in showing these technologies, the touch sensitive space and so on, in their in their clunkiness and in their uh, imperfection. Um, perhaps Rachel was the original critic of, of, of Arknag, and perhaps that's why Negroponte and others were not happy about that representation of technology, because it showed how far they were from the rhetoric of, of, of seamlessness and technological success that was being advertised in the lab. So those are just some starting thoughts that I let Theora uh, uh, connect and um, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't have much to add. I think you you kind of uh, channeled also some of the kind of things that we were discussing uh, earlier. Um, and yeah, in a way, when we were thinking about the symposium structure, I mean, um, surface and structure seemed kind of like a clear diet also in the, in the rhetoric about computing historically, there was this idea of structure as revealing what hides beneath uh, and giving us a a new kind of plateau of, of, of agency making um, you know, surfaces more malleable, sometimes 
um, revealing a kind of truth that we cannot kind of see. Um, and I think processes, uh, the kind of third term that we that we kind of inserted in, in the symposium, I think stands quite critically in relationship to this kind of like structural optimism in the sense that processes, I think, suggest an idea about time, about temporality, about change. We can debate that, maybe yes, maybe not. Uh, so today, I think we see the, the, the panel as standing uh, kind of quite critically in relationship to this idea of, of, of structure as, as, a, as the kind of, um, you know, standing of, for, for agency when it comes to computing. So what does it mean to think procedurally and how do ideas of temporality, performativity, embodiment come in? And so with that, we're, we're particularly excited to welcome today's speakers. Um, uh, Gabriela Seveser Priveda, David Theodore, and Rajon Daliwal. Um, and I will begin by introducing our session's chair. Uh, I should also mention that after today's panel, we have uh, Liz van der Zag um, in the afternoon, and we hope you will all uh, join us for that. She will be in conversation with Gabriela, who's, of course, a scholar of your work, and, and I think it's going to be a particularly fruitful and exciting exchange. Um, so Olga, um, I'll try to keep that formal, but it's hard to do because Olga, of course, is a, is a dear friend and colleague uh, and collaborator. Um, uh, she has been a person who, uh, with whom we've, we've very often exchanged ideas on some of the topics that we're discussing today. Um, even though her scholarship focuses on a, on a, on a different um, uh, domain. So Olga Tulumi is Assistant Professor of Architectural History at Bard College. And uh, she researches the role of architecture and media in 20th century forms of liberal internationalism. Her book project, which is now under contract, congratulations, uh, The Global Interior, uh, Modern Architecture and World Making in the United Nations, concerns the design and building of 20th century public platforms for multilateralism and international relations. Olga has co-edited Sound Modernities, Architecture, Media and Design, um, which is a special issue in the Journal of Architecture, um, investigating how acoustics and mass media, such as the radio and the telephone, transformed modern architectural culture in the 20th century. And I'm going to do a shameless book promotion, this book with me, Computer Architectures, uh, Constructing the Common Ground, uh, in a series that was actually initiated by uh, Daniel uh, Cardoso and Terry Knight uh, at MIT which looks at, at uh, kind of early exchanges between designers and technologists in uh, European and North American uh, institutions. Um, so her scholarship is prolific. She has appeared in numerous journals and edited volumes, uh, the Journal of the Society of Architectural Historians, Buildings and Landscapes, Journal of Architecture, and the Harvard Design Magazine. She has been a visiting scholar at the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science, and she has also received several uh, fellowships and research grants from the National Endowment of the Humanities, BART, Harvard, the UNASIS Foundation, the Canadian Center for Architecture, and so on. She's also the co-founder of the Feminist Art and Architectural Collaborative and board member of the Center for Critical Studies in Architecture. So Olga, it's, it's a huge pleasure to have you here today, and uh, I pass the baton to you. Uh, Thank you, Fedora and, um, and Daniel. So uh, welcome to the third and final day of digital visual material. Um, I'm talking to you from the land of the Stockbridge Mansi community. In the spirit of truth and equity, it is with gratitude and humility that I acknowledge that I am speaking from the sacred homelands of the Mansi and Mohican people who are the original stewards of this land. Today, due to forced removal, the community resides in northeast um, Wisconsin and is known as the Stockbridge Mansi community. We honor and pay respect to their ancestors, past and present, as well as to future generations, and we recognize their continuity, continuing presence in their homelands. We understand that our acknowledgement requires those of us who are settlers to recognize our own place in and responsibilities towards addressing inequity and that this ongoing and challenging work requires that we commit to real engagement with the Mansi and Mohican communities to build an inclusive and equitable space for all. The last couple of days have been very 
productive and expansive and in the spirit of the Mansi and Mohican communities, it is with much gratitude that I thank Daniel and Theodora for creating homekeeping and sustaining an equitable and inclusive space, intersectional, transgenerational and interdisciplinary for critical discussions on computers and computation, culture in design, art and architecture. Please know, Theodora and Daniel, that the community and space you have created always feels home to many of us. Now, today the theme is processes. Uh, practitioners and technologies uh, aspirational claim is that technology at large and computers in particular reside outside the realm of human activity, outside the social milieu and its politics. However, as Black study scholar uh, Ruha Benjamin so poignantly discusses, processes, the processes that produce computers and the processes that computers uh, create um, or the socio-technological complex that we name computer, for other sites like hospitals, prisons, banks, laboratories, schools, military camps, have been structured by and reproduced algorithmic discrimination and racial and gender bias. Processes offer a valuable opportunity to interrogate computers entanglements with the social production and reproduction of our societies and the political and economic drives that organize them. They also challenge us to think about the intersection of technological thinking, the built environment and society. It is an opportunity to address labor and the inequities within it operates, institutional politics, the circulation of money and resources, developmentalism, gender and racial inequities, settler colonial ideologies and the politics of extraction. So very big group of conversations. Um, today's papers will allow us to open some of those conversations, of course, not all. Uh, and I want to welcome and introduce our speakers now, uh, as I have set a little bit of the framework with the help of Theodora and Daniel, of course. Uh, Gabriela Seves Sepulveda, uh, is assistant professor at the School of Interactive Arts and Technology at Simon Fraser University, where she directs the Critical Media Art Studio and Interdisciplinary Research and Creation Studio. She has degrees in design, media arts and cultural history, a complex background. Her work investigates the histories of art at the intersection of science and technology in the Americas. She's the author of Woman Made Visible, uh, Feminist Art and Media in Post-1968 Mexico, published by University of Nebraska Press. Thank you for this work, Gabriela. And several peer-reviewed articles, book chapters um, on media, feminist media art and archival practice in Latin America. Uh, other interests include the connections between sound, race and gender, environmental entanglements of digital technologies, its histories and infrastructures, and the theories and histories of embodiment and performance. Here, video and sculptural installations explore the body as a site of cultural, gender, and biopolitical inscriptions, and they have been exhibited in Canada, Mexico, France, India, Chile, and the US, of course. Today, she will be talking about feminist interventions in the West Coast, the case of video art and computer graphics. Our second speaker is uh, going to be David Theodore, who is the Canada Research Chair in Architecture, Health and Computation at McGill University. His research has received support from CIHR, the Graham Foundation, SSHRC, and the Pierre Trudeau Foundation. He has co-published on the history of healthcare architecture in numerous journals, among them social science and medicine, technology and culture, and the Canadian Bulletin of Medical History. He has also contributed to design journals worldwide, including Canadian Architect, Frame, Harvard Design Magazine, JAE, Log, Riba Journal. And he is presenting Imposter Cities, as we speak, uh, as the official Canadian entry for the upcoming 17th International Architecture Exhibition of La Biennale di Venezia with TBA, and um, which is huge. And today um, he will be presenting um, work on the relationship between topology, crystals, and a multitude of futures. Very interested in 
<laughs> in what this will entail. So thank you, David, for being here. And last but not least, by any means, is um, Ran Ranjad Singh Daliwal, um, who is a PhD candidate in English and Science and Technology Studies at the University of California, Davis. Is this right? Um, I not just anymore. Not anymore. I just finished my PhD two days Congratulations. ago. Congratulations. Thank you. Sorry about that. It's, a, it's always like a, a weird transition. Yeah. <laughs> and he's incoming assistant professor at the University of Notre Dame. So here, real congratulations um, for really landing such a great job. Uh, he has also been a visiting research fellow at the Research Cluster Media of Cooperation in the University of Saigen, Germany. Uh, Ranjot's research with traces the aesthetic and political entanglements of our technological cultures, lies at the intersection of science fiction studies, critical media theory, and histories of science and technology. He is the winner of the 2020 Edwin Bruns Prize from the Society of Literature, Science, and the Arts, and his research has been supported by the University of California Humanities Research Institute, the German Research Foundation, Linda Hall Library, and my personal favorite, the Hagley Museum, among other institutions. Um, he is currently working on a book project titled Rendering a Political Diagrammatology of Computation. And today he will be talking about T-square space war and interfaces of early spatial computing. So as you see, this will be quite the day and we will have the opportunity to further socialize and politicize um, the digital, the visual and the material through the question of processes. So thank you all and the baton goes to Gabriela. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen. Hopefully it's gonna work. Um, okay. Oh, I can't uh, share my screen. I think. Uh, uh, can you try it again now? Sorry. Sure. Yeah, no problem. Okay. Um, hopefully, you can um, see my slides. Yeah, great. Um, well, thank you so much to Daniel and Theodora for organizing the symposium and giving me the opportunity to participate and present my research with all of you. It's a great honor. And thank you for the summary of the previous sessions. I unfortunately haven't been able to attend, but that just gives me a really uh, good overview of what's been going on. Thank you so much. Um, so before I begin, I would like to acknowledge that I am connecting uh, from the unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples of the Musqueam, the Squamish, the Salish Tooth uh, nations, which is otherwise known as Vancouver, British Columbia, uh, where I live and work as an uninvited guest. So in this talk, I will present some preliminary research that is part of a broader project that investigates the role of women as agents of technology. And in this project, I seek to address an important gap in the historiography of video and media art more generally by bringing attention to the multiple roles that women play in the development and use of video technology beyond being solely art producers. As a media historian, I'm interested in asking how does a curator enable artistic experimentation with technology? How should we include curators in the histories of media art? How do we account for the role of an archivist in maintaining and securing ongoing access to analog or digital born artworks in the context of technological obsolescence and constant change? And thinking particularly about the recent interest in the histories of computational art in Canada, can we recognize the work of artists who have created and experimented with new aesthetic languages and supported the development of digital tools and digital literacies in multiple capaci capacities, uh, rather than solely focusing or, or our attention in artists that can code. So these questions are framed by a feminist lens that seeks to understand the work of women as agents of technology um, who are deeply connected and embedded in their social and professional worlds, uh, rather than thinking of them as uh, sole agents or as geniuses that are working in a vacuum. So through this lens, uh, I look at a wide ranging 
uh, roles that women have played in the development of video and computer graphics. Um, oh. So I will center my talk today on a video art exhibition entitled The Phosphorus Diode, Synthesized Visions in Canadian Video Art, curated by Karen Henry and presented at the Video Inn in Vancouver in 1985. I will discuss the early work of um, Elizabeth van der Sack, um, which we later on will have um, the opportunity to talk to her about her work um, from the 1990s onwards. Um, and her current interest. So um, let me begin um, by saying that, uh, while the histories of video art in Vancouver are well documented and the interventions of feminist artists in the field are receiving much deserved attention, I am interested in making visible the wider and sometimes simultaneous, but not fully examining roles that women play as mentors, curators, administrators, archivists, innovators, educators, technologies, and also as artists experimenting with video. Um, and in this case in particular, in facilitating access to analog and digital video technology in Vancouver, a city which is known for its vibrant artist-run center culture and video and performance art scenes since the, 19, or since the late 1960s. A place where the use of new, new technologies was fueled by the circulation of Marshall McLuhan ideas on media and technology, and in particularly by an embrace of interdisciplinarity and, um, and collaboration as a critique to mainstream forms of art production. I'm gonna, are you, are you able to see your, your faces? Um, I'm just gonna move the chat. I don't know, because I'm gonna be playing video. I just wanna move something, sorry. No, we don't see your chat window. Sorry. No, okay, perfect, sorry. <laughs> um, so as Marina Roy tells us, uh, despite the dominant masculine environment that, that uh, permeated around artist-run center cultures in the city, women did find a, a, a space, an alternative space to their homes where they could live and work as artists. So Phosphorus Diode was organized as a program of video screenings at the Video Inn. It was by no means a large or a unique exhibition. Uh, but it called my attention for the particular ways that it addresses intersections between the digital, the visual, and the material, which are uh, a thematic focus of this, uh, ex uh, of this symposium and its accompanied exhibition, and for the way in which it acts as evidence of the role of women as agents of technologies in various capacities, without explicitly stating that as a, a concern, because it was not an all-women exhibit. As it is well known, women artists in Vancouver, as elsewhere, had turned to video and performance since the late 1960s. The newness of both uh, mediums provided them with opportunities to make them their own as neither had the masculinist baggage of previous art forms. Performance and video art also provided artists with opportunities to collaborate, explore their own identities and engage in social activism. By the early 1970s, along with the establishment of the Western Front Society and the video in in 1973, two of the most well-known artist-run centers in Vancouver and where Karen Henry developed her career, there were multiple events and collectives that focus exclusively on the work of women in film, television, and video. These exclusive endeavors responded to the emergence of second wave feminisms worldwide, to the resolutions of the United Nations International Women's Year Conference in 1975, which demanded a transformation in the ways in which the media tended to reinforce traditional attitudes and portrayals of women. Um, and in the particular context of Canada, uh, the 1970s Commission on the Status of Women made important recommendations, including pay equity, the right to abortion, and access to education, as well as higher skilled paying jobs. Equally important was the role uh, of the Canada Council for the Arts in funding and encouraging the use of technology in the cultural realm to strengthen the country's image globally, but also to, um, you know, women were um, supported through their funding. And another important uh, aspect was the access to community cable television granted by the Canadian Radio Television Commission, which also opened up spaces for the professionalization of women in, in the media. So in the interest of time, I'm not gonna to discuss all the women media collectives active at the time. Suffice to say that um, some artists involved in Phosphorus Diode collaborated with some of these all women focused collectives and um, this included Real Feelings, 
uh, established by Ardell Lister, Women in Focus, and Amelia Productions, um, um, established by Sarah Diamond, to name a few. So the point here is to just uh, set up the context um, so you, you understand that there was a strong presence of women artists interested in video in Vancouver at the time. So moving to the exhibition, uh, taking its name from the basic element of light transmission in the video monitor and the basic component of the electronic image, uh, Karen Henry's phosphorus diode presented the exploration of 15 Canadian artists working with video in 1980s, an era that in 1981, Jean Youngblood uh, described as the adulthood of video. And I quote, he said, a period where we will look back and see that it will be the first take of maturity of the medium as a medium. And obviously it came after uh, of, um, of its infancy, which was in 1960s and its adolescence in the 1970s. So Youngblood arrived to this assessment in the face of what he was seeing uh, as very rapid developments in video technology, particularly at the time, uh, the, the, the production of the first video cameras with the charge coupled devices or CCDs were, were being produced, uh, which promised to make video technology more accessible to all and obviously increase its resolution. And it is interesting to note that Youngblood presented these thoughts on the maturity of video to the Vancouver community at a talk held at the Video Inn. So while, while indeed access to video technology was increasing in the 1980s, artists in Vancouver still uh, mostly relied on equipment available to artists uh, via artist-run centers or through professional connections with independent and pu public broadcasting companies. As a young writer, uh, curator, and a single mother, Karen Henry began to collaborate uh, at both the Video in um, Exchange Society and the Western Front in the early 1980s. She began writing interviews with artists and reviews on exhibitions and new technologies, like the article we see here on the Teledon system, uh, a, a video uh, based on the video text technology. And her articles were published in the Video Guide magazine, which was a, a quarterly newsletter published by the Video In, which was an important access of information that brought international and national news on video art to all Canadian readers. As part of the critical interest in video at the time, Henry became particularly um, curious about how access to materials, technology, and working spaces influence uh, artistic practice. In a recent interview uh, with her, she told me, and I quote, I remember interviewing a young artist working on collage. Um, she did not work in video, uh, but she was one of the artists that made me think about how the circumstances that surround an artist completely affects their work their scale and the medium in which they work. At this time, this artist that I was interviewing uh, was a young mother and she was making small collages in her kitchen table. So you can compare this work to the, to the big light boxes of Jeff Wall, and then you can realize how the nature of the work is affected by the circumstances and the kind of access to materials and technologies artists have. So at that time I was working at the video end and I was watching all the new equ equipment coming in and I was, look I was uh, witnessing how artists were working with the equipment and experimenting with it. So, end quote. In Phosphorus Diode, Henry explored this concern as they applied uh, particularly to video and video effects. So the artist presented in the exhibition appropriated the latest technology and, um, and also reworked it in their own terms. And the exhibition um, curatorial essay was framed by a quote by Arthur Corner, Crocker, um, in which um, expresses some of the anxieties around uh, the rapid advances in technology and the different roles that artists and engineers um, will play or were playing at the time. And I find the, the quote um, um, in a way that, that sometime, somehow echoes um, some of our concerns with technology. At, and in, uh, today. So I quote, um, we live now with, with the great secret and equally the great anxiety that the technological experience is both Orwellian and hopelessly utopian, exhibiting as it does conflict tendencies towards emancipation and manipulation. Technological society presents us with the fateful but opposing models of the engineer and the artist as ways of relating to the new society of technique. End quote. 
So the main focus, as I said in uh, the exhibition, was on image manipulation, um, the formal qualities that artists were ex experimenting with. Um, but it also references the technical, the economical, and the material and environmental spaces that they faced when trying to, to engage with emerging video technology. And in particular, the struggle for access and the alternative ways that artists have employed uh, to achieve hands-on experience and make the most of the simple equipment available to them. So the, brought, uh, the show brought together a generation of artists um, that experimented with analog and digital video, including Elizabeth Vanderzak, Arda Lister, Cornelia Wintergarden, and Jane Wright, along with other 11 artists. Um, I'm just concentrating on the work of these four artists. Um, so all of them explore the potential to manipulate and manufacture images in real time using a wide array of video manipulation systems uh, that were available at the time that included uh, the Aniputer developed by Japanese artist Ko Nakajima that allowed for drawing on top of the video signal. Uh, the video text um, system, which was a picture description system and um, that um, then was further developed by the Canadian government as a teledon. Um, the Sony SMC70, which was a time-based corrector with the capacity to layer digital and analog images. And the Ampex digital optics that also had the capacity to layer images on top of each other, but also to work in X, Y, and Z axis, adding perspective and depth to, to the video image. So Arda Lister and Jane Wright, who at the time were working also at, uh, at the Experimental Television Center ETC in Owego, New York, um, presented a, um, much more uh, sophisticated work because they had access to much more sophisticated equipment um, there. So here I'm just going to play a little expert, excerpt without sound uh, from Jane Wright, uh, Lake Huron. Uh, so you can see some of the images that were being produced. It's a very simple contemplative video. And uh, I want to play an excerpt, a longer excerpt of Ardell Lister's adaptation of Dante's Hell, um, in, uh, in which she welcomes us to, to the hell of today, of the 1980s, um, which was the hell of information storage and retrieval. So this one has sound, so I'm hoping it's going to be playing. Ladies and gentlemen, Madame and Monsieur, welcome to hell. Not the simple hell of antiquity with its smelly pit and feeble devils with their pitchforks and whips, far from it. Welcome to the hell of today, the modern hell of information storage and retrieval, a hell more insidious and horrific than any imagined in fire and ice. The hell of today, that's what the computer's all about. It's, you know, it's a being without a soul. Efficiency was all he wanted. I, give you I have it now. On one disc, you can store 1,700 souls. It stores, imprisons, and tortures souls. No mean task. One day I was, I was on Lexington Avenue near Bloomingdale's and I was in a coffee shop and I, I met this guy and he was, he was the devil and he, he offered me a job. Well, the next day I got electrocuted at the computer terminal. Um, next, I want to show you an excerpt from uh, Elizabeth Vanderzak's uh, Red Notion. Uh, which was a playful reflection on politics and things that are made visible and invisible as we mature. So the tone between the two videos is very different, um, as you will see, but both really interesting. Um, in this video, Van der Sack uses the SMC70 to layer images, um, but she also experimented with chroma key effects and with low tech strategies, including um, building paper cutouts and, and, and toys and putting them in front of the screen and then uh, re uh, recording uh, that. Um, so let's see. It also has some sound.
Um, so the layering of analogs and digital images to produce playful and richly textured um, composites combined with a synthesized soundtrack seen in Red Notion became key in van der Sack's aesthetic sensibility. And it's also present in another work of this time. Uh, it's called Baby Eyes from 1984, which it's included in the exhibition that accompanies the symposium. So in Baby Eyes, um, van der Sack explores the potential of technology in mediating mother and child relations. It was produced um, in between breastfeedings as she was uh, a, a, a recent mother and using the Ko Nakajima's Annie Pewter to draw on top of images. So in the video, what we're gonna see is how Van der Zag explores and imagines how her baby daughter perceives the world and the computer is, and the manipulation of images is what allows her um, to imagine and explore this, this uh, vision. So in the interest of time, I'm just going to stop it there, but um, we'll hopefully have opportunity to watch it uh, all. So prior to this work, van der Sack had developed the Digit series, a program of short videos that appeared in the experimental television program, The Gina Show, broadcasted in Vancouver uh, Cable 10 from 1978 to 1981. The Digit series fe featured a digit, digit, a female computer generated character, and at times van der Sack art art persona. Having moved from Ontario to British Columbia in 1974, um, Van der Sack was part of an emerging group of artists, researchers, and computer scientists interested in exploring the creative potential of computers. As a video technician at Simon Fraser University, um, she had gained equipment, um, access to equipment, resources, and research on the latest developments um, in computer graphics, including uh, those development at the Sonic uh, Research Institute um, managed by Barry Truax at the, and the kinesiology lab directed at the computer scientist, um, um, at the kinesiology lab directed by computer scientist Tom Calvert. Um, and where the, um, the researchers there were beginning to develop uh, motion capture technology to represent human movement realistically. Um, sorry, I'm having an issue with my, sorry. And one of the early outcomes of the research was um, Jerry Barinholtz's computer animation program, Grax, which was able to render curved lines. And Digit Goes to Hawaii, uh, uh, which is also included in the exhibition, is one of Van der Zag's, uh, first experiments with Grax. And we're just going to see a little quick excerpt. Digit Goes to Hawaii.
So born out of Van der Zeg's interest in computers and uh, the fruit of her immersion in academic and artistic fields, the, with the Digit series, Van der Zeg investigated her own position as an artist, anticipating the reconfigurations of subjectivity through technology formulated by Donna Haraway in the 1970s, in the 1980s, sorry. I'm just going to click so you can watch while I talk. Um, um, with the digit series, Spandersack experimented with her own position as an artist, uh, anticipating, as I said, configurations uh, of subjectivity through technology. Every week and with uh, limited access to computer, Vandersack improvised and took turns presenting a digit at the Gina show, um, which was uh, this animated camera that sometimes she, pre she presented uh, as herself, as her persona present, uh, um, performing in front of the camera or as a digital construct. So through a combination of drawings, performance, spoken words, synthesized sounds, effects, and video images, Digit manifested as either the artist's digital offspring or her alter ego. Each of the short videos, and we're seeing a, a lot of excerpts here, uh, include a, a sound mix, um, audio, audio effects, detailing um, Digit's um, digital adventures, and sometimes they blended with uh, Van der Zag's personal life. Um, so, these, so through these weekly experiments, uh, Digit uh, constructed a sense of self that was inseparable from her tools, much like other feminist video artists of the era. And through this relation, she questioned the dominant ontology of early and current digital systems, which treat numerical value as the underlying principle of nature, thus rendering nature and its reproduction uh, via algorithmic uh, models possible. In contrast, Van der Sack's feminist sensibility expressed how the attempt at simulating reality via computer systems was fraught and messy. Digit was not a simulation of the artist, nor an independent digital construct. It was her daughter, her artist persona. It existed both inside and outside the mainframe. It was simultaneously a drawing, a numerical value, a code, a voice, and a body. So Van der Zag's explorations on the female voice continue through various interactive works, expanding into her teaching and research on the visual sense of language to explore subjective and cultural sensibilities through interactive systems, something that we will have the opportunity to discuss with Elizabeth in the afternoon. And just uh, before I conclude, I know I'm running out of time, just want to point out that throughout the 1980s, Van der Sack taught video workshops at the Women in Focus, at the Western Front, and at the Video Inn. Uh, her technical writings on computer graphics uh, also appeared at the, at the video guide uh, um, regularly. She also traveled across Canada hosting uh, training sessions on the use of uh, various Sony multi-digital video effect consoles. And in 1993, she established the Western Front Media Training School, a video training school for artists. And in all these capacities, Van der Sack played an important role in democratizing access to technology and supporting the digital literacy among other artists. Um, in turn, and uh, after Phosphorus Diode, Karen Henry curated Luminous Sites along with Diana Oglatis at the Western Front. And this was a large exhibition of Canadian video installations across multiple uh, venues in the city. And soon after, she would become director of the Western Front, where she would continue to support Arby's Run centers and uh, given access to uh, and promoting exchanges with a lot of artists. So um, to conclude, I just want to, um, to say that um, this both uh, young, very young women uh, working in a predominantly masculine environment of the 70s and the 80s, they neither um, of them saw, um, saw their gender or their sexual difference as a source of oppression. They, they mostly um, were very enthusiastic about working out, uh, with art and technology and made use of the opportunities that, that came their way to have, carve their own paths with a unique feminist sensibility that supported and encouraged the use of video technology among other artists. So thank you. Thank you, Gabriela. Wonderful work. Um, I'm looking forward to have discussion later in the Q and A. Uh, David, uh, you're next. The baton is to you. Uh, thank you. All right. So, um, thanks, everyone. Good morning. Um, Uh, let me see. 
I, I'm, I'm just a, stuck in a thought already because um, uh, I haven't thought about Vancouver's video scene in a long time. And it just occurs to me um, how different a story about some of the things I'm about to say you could tell if you told it from you know, the lofts in Gastown in Vancouver rather than from the, the lofts in London, which I'm going to attempt a little bit. So um, I'll give it a go. Topology, crystals, and a multitude of futures. In 1970, British architect John Weeks and researcher Gordon Best presented a three-dimensional communication lattice diagram at the annual conference of the American Hospitals Association. Published later that year in Health Services Research, the diagram set out organizational principles for the planning and design of future flexible health sciences facilities. So you can see one of the healthcare complex they had just designed in the background of this title slide, it's Northwick Park Hospital and Clinical Research Center in London. I'm using it here today as a, a bit of nostalgia. Um, I had it in my slides the last time I presented at a conference organized by Theodora and co-organized by Olga, and I didn't get, in the end get to use it. So this is revenge, I guess. Um, here's a, another kind of muscular picture of it under construction in 1969. I show it often because it's a, a key moment in the history of computation and architecture. It's the first building constructed based on a parametric design. Around 1965, engineers generated the facade pattern um, of the prefabricated concrete um, structural mullions uh, using a computer-oriented algorithm based on structural loads. So the architect, John Weeks, boasted that he did not design the facade, the algorithm did. And I'll come back to this claim briefly later. Uh, as said, the diagram is intended to visualize the organization of key pathways in the planning and design of future flexible health science facilities. Flexibility was an important challenge, but a uh, very vexed terminology. It signaled contemporary anxieties about obviating obsolescence, as Daniel Abramson has written about. It's also related to what uh, Joey Brzezowski uh, talked about this week uh, on Wednesday, which he put as a question, something like, how do we design for something that is inherently transformative? That's a question for Joey today. It was a question for Weeks and Best in 1965. So the issue is it goes something like this. If you start planning a hospital, by the time the first patient is admitted, will the hospital be out of date? What about future population growth? So this uh, graph here was made by uh, Weeks team for a master plan for Ottawa, uh, Canada's capital city. Um, was medical change now so accelerated that architecture just simply could not keep pace? Did the future of computing imply new concepts for hospital planning or design or construction and hospital operation? And what about future funding and future medical training and changing morbidity patterns in communities? What about the multitude of futures? Weeks and Best had a, a pretty powerful response. Planners and architects, they argued, now under a who understand growth and change as the prime forces in design for complex buildings such as hospitals. Growth and change were the only constants, the positive and major design parameters. So here's the lattice diagram. This is it. Uh, let me read out a little bit about what they, their explanation. Communication lattice in health sciences facility. Each strand in lattice represents a communication path. So on the top part of the diagram, part A, they write two points A and B can be connected by many paths, each finding different node points in complex. In the middle diagram, addition of through communication spine provides users with bypass system. This would connect to each of the vertical strands in the lattice here symbolizing elevator banks. And at the bottom part C, uh, subsystems may have independent lives and independent extension requirements. These are attached to main system in such a way that its chief characteristics are not affected. So here's my proposition. By 1970, the design problem of the modern health sciences center had been solved. 
And this is a diagram of that solution. The genius of the solution was that it provided not a technical object nor a set of techniques, but a continuous variable independent of the additional conditions, adjustable. So you could, you could change things, not just because of the value of a parameter changed, but because the parameter itself changed. So it's neither a technical solution nor a metaphor, it's a way to actualize a relational system. Here's a, a close-up of part C. Um, so yeah, my, my problem is that I probably can't convince you of any of this. Um, I echo uh, or I sympathize deeply with John May uh, in the opening of his remarks. Um, where uh, I, I just don't quite believe what I'm saying anymore. And I haven't yet, my ship has set sail, but has not landed at a new port. So um, another problem is that what I just outlined is not exactly what, what Weeks and Best wrote. And in fact, one of the things that they were very good at was changing their rhetoric, depending on the audience they were addressing. In other words, they would say something slightly different in a report to a hospital board than they would say at a conference to architects or to when they were talking to doctors. So there's a level of rhetoric in what they are writing that just can't be teased apart from the rhetoric of the diagram itself. And it's a problem in uh, how to write history whose best solutions that we have kind of thick interpretation or micro history, the, the techniques that we use to explore the social technical are, as they say, um, they've been running out of steam, let's put it that way. So instead, what I'm just going to do quickly today is take you through some digressions, some impressions, sort of stroll through the world of post-war hospital design, pointing out a path through the terrain that, um, uh, so this is a paraphrase of something they write somewhere, the tar pits of mathematical abstraction and the quicksand of concrete meaning. So what are we supposed to see when we look at this diagram? Um, so I'm going to start with the familiar. This is the poster for cybernetic serendipity, that important um, exhibition shown in London in 1968 in the US in 1969. It's a high profile moment of the crossover between computers and capital A art that we've been foregrounding this week. Uh, as it says in the small type on the poster, an exhibition de demonstrating how man can use the computer and new technology to extend the scope of his creativity and inventiveness. The show featured uh, computer-generated music, computer-generated text, computer-generated graphics, cybernetic sculptures, and um, some remote-controlled robots. The parametric design for Northwick Park was included. These are the drawings shown in the exhibition catalog. Uh, you can see the algorithm algorithmically generated pattern of structural emulsions, um, as it were, straight from the printer. But note that the algorithm itself is not shown. Uh, my point here is that interpret interpreting the question of the visual versus the mathematical has to include the specifics of situations like this. These are not working images that have escaped from the lab somehow, but rather calculated communications calibrated for precise and situated audiences. So next, uh, another vexed concept, structure. This is the poster to another exhibition, the This Is Tomorrow show at the Whitechapel Art Gallery in London in 1956. Uh, it's the show that prefigured art movements in Britain, such as pop art and collaborative art. Uh, and many of the artists designed posters that were used to advertise the show. This is the poster designed for the show by John Weeks, the designer of the lattice diagram. So to, for this show, they uh, collected together 12 different multidisciplinary teams that worked independently from each other. And John Weeks was uh, part of two separate teams. So as part of group, um, I think it's group nine, no, group 11, he collaborated with visual artist, Adrian Heath. They made this brick wall inside the gallery and one review of the show at the time had this to say, and I'll just quote it. Some concepts of structure, geometry clothed in substance, proved to be the basic or unifying postulate of most groups offerings. And in one case, the partnership of John Weeks and Adrian Heath, structure 
was the totality of the exhibit, a wall of standard breaks, which were displaced or admitted to give it the plasticity and symbolic significance of an abstract sculpture. Um, these are a couple of images from Darcy Thompson's book, Growth and Form. I tried to do the presentation without it, I swear, uh, but I can explain. Um, the lattice diagram combined two scientific topics, the lattice structure from crystallography and topology from mathematics. Both, of course, were old news by the time Weeks and Best drew their diagram. They had been kind of codified towards the end of the 19th century. Yet in adopting them, Weeks and Best followed the practice, uh, very relevant in post-war Britain, of borrowing scientific concepts and repurposing them for art and architecture. But when I was preparing this talk, Theodore and Daniel challenged me to include quotations from Weeks and Best talking about these topics directly. What did they think topology was? What did they think uh, crystallography was? So we know from Alma's talk this week about topology, and I will get back to it a little bit, but crystallography is more elusive. So this is my indirect evidence. In Growth and Form, Darcy Thompson wrote on space lattice theory and the structural arrangement of crystalline molecules, but he was most interested in the, in the lattices of shells and skeletons like these shown here. And there's, there's absolutely no doubt that his ideas in the book were debated among the independent group, the avant-garde art circles weeks moved in in the post-war. And specifically, Week's second collaboration for the This Is Tomorrow show was a part of Group 9 with Kenneth Martin and Mary Martin, who were known to draw on these ideas. Um, so there, there's a, a, a correct connection to the lattice that would have been um, conversations they had every day. So the collaboration on This Is Tomorrow led to uh, the project shown here one year later. This is a sculpture called Waterfall, uh, created by Mary Martin for an experimental hospital in Belfast designed by John Weeks. Okay, so here the collaboration explicitly relied on interplay between mathematics as structure. So the emphasis on uh, modularity and proportionality of the design and material as structure, the modularity and proportionality of the, of the brick. Here's another view of the sculpture. Uh, it's made of brick and stainless steel and some um, painted plaster. Uh, so the question I'm trying to draw attention to is about mathematics material and what's made visible. And here's a paraphrase from a recent essay on Mary Martin's work. Uh, so at Musgrave Park Hospital, Mary Martin adopted the measurements and proportions of the modular system determined by the architects. She also utilized the same materials used in the building itself. Thus, a critic at the time wrote, proportionally and materially, the work is linked with the building which contains it. And both of these are clearly visible. So then let's zip across the ocean to downtown Boston. This is a press image from an unbuilt project for a new health sciences center for Tufts University. You can see the site for this project in a swirl of white. And it, it's um, not cleanly delineated because the major innovation of the project was to conceive of an in urban hospital as an urban design project, emphasizing connections of medical activities deep into the neighborhood, into traffic planning, into overall urban development. And it continues to influence health sciences planning today. So this is a, a, an image from around 1963 uh, from the, um, I'll just read the caption, members of the Tufts New England Medical Center's planning staff demonstrate their system circulation display panel, which enables them to simulate certain limited interrelations of a hospital subsystem. And then the model at the bottom at the right, this model is being used by the planning office for the study of a single pediatric nursing floor with six, 10 bed acute care clusters. So you're getting a top view of a physical model and a frontal view of a, a handmade um, computer. So um, the, the, this handmade computer was called a people machine work system. It allowed planners to simulate relations in operations or size. So 
There's a grid of nails on the wall and the colored discs are hung on the wall arranged based on data gathered through direct observation of operations, equipment, activities, uh, and personnel. So you can kind of compute changes by moving the uh, quantity or arrangement uh, of discs on the wall. And the goal here was to make the planner uh, um, a so-called change agent, actively intervening, not just passively documenting activities and designing to accommodate them, but actively restructuring hospital life through this kind of computation. One advantage of doing it this way is that it allowed possible concepts to emerge as concepts rather than as floor plans. So uh, again, the main issue to bear in mind is always flexibility. And architects had already established by this time the horizontal hospital as the norm. Study after study after study showed that the horizontal hospital had clear advantages for flexibility. But ease of movement and future flexibility meant a loss of connectivity as a hospital grew in size. It might work for a small hospital uh, of 100 patients, but it doesn't work for a large urban hospital of 500 patients. So in this case, the team experimented with various ways to connect services and activities vertically. So that's what you're seeing in this diagrammatic section. The ground level becomes uh, very, very important, um, but then the, the the advantage you have is a bunch of connections between um, activities in the hospital that would otherwise be very, very far apart if it was laid out horizontally. Um, and, and just to, to say why this is an experiment, it, 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 um, why this doesn't make sense as an actual plan for a hospital, let me put it that way, is just look at level eight where it says mechanical space supply distribution. So that's not a good, place to put the supply distribution on the top of an eight-story building. The pragmatic place for it is underground. That's where you know, supplies arrive on trucks. Trucks don't drive on level eight. But when you're working with connections and relationships, when you're working with a topological diagram, the planners propose that novel ideas like this one could, could emerge rather than be um, held back by the physical constraints of more responsive planning. So this is a page from uh, a 1973 article uh, Weeks wrote surveying hospital design around the world. Um, yeah, okay. These are two projects from his own firm was working on. On the top is one in, in Australia and the bottom was a plan for one in London. And, and they're just there to show that the lattice idea in action um, the, this idea that the planner was driving change rather than merely responding to it was really important for hospital planners of the era. Um, another guy I like to write about, Washington DC-based consultant Gordon Friesen, always said, uh, went, went around saying, let me put it that way, that industrial engineering was more important than architecture. You shouldn't ask pilots and passengers about their needs and aggregate the result to design an airplane. Instead, you should design the airplane according to the best principles and then train the plant pilots how to fly them. He said, it's the same for hospitals. Don't ask the doctors and nurses what they're doing right now, design the best hospital and then just train them to work in it. So this is a ooh, little blurry, sorry. This is the, uh, close-up of the lattice model for the, the hospital in Australia. Uh, and it, it just has all those things that I've been trying to talk about. Departments requiring highly specific space are attached to the main communication system. The ground is free for access and car parking. The main shaft links all the levels together. There's these selected node points and so on and so forth. Um, uh, I mean, the, the, the question of the, the last diagram is supposed to be a solution for many buildings, but it is specifically a solution for a hospital building. So, the, I mean, the, the, I, still, I still want to insist that uh, I think that they solved the problem of the hospital with this design. There's, there's no problems about how to design a hospital left unsolved here. It, it's like the design of a toaster has been solved. There's, there's, we still need to deploy it. We can still design new toasters somehow, certainly in new colors and so on. But the, the solution has existed for what a health sciences center is for 50 years. 
And I, as I said, I probably can't convince you of that. Um, so instead, I will end with a briefer look or a closer look at the, the diagram itself. So a first thing to note is that earlier diagrams emphasized uh, a certain, uh, a stricter geometry. This one published around 1965 makes the claim for future flexibility, but in two dimensions only, and, and without the possibility of topological freedom. Uh, instead, it addresses the service infrastructure, plumbing, HVAC, electricity, and communications are all abstracted here rather than as uh, parameters, but uh, rather as constraints on the programming. So the solution ends up being a sausage, a building of fixed width whose length could be uh, indeterminate and, and extended at will. The lattice diagram overcame those restrictions through two moves. First, the principle of the lattice allowed for the direct incorporation of vertical connections into the plan. No more sausages. Second, this diagram is, quote, translatable into building for a wide variety of physical situations. And while it may be distorted, its topological characteristics remain constant. They insisted that the model provides a framework within which potentially flexible metafacilities can be specified. It does not itself create flexible buildings. It's a solution, not that solution. Um, so here's how the lattice diagram becomes visualized as a diagram for a building. Communication lines are shown as arrow. Each black node is a vertical communication system, usually coinciding with axes such as fire stairs and elevator banks. And the whole lattice can now extend, not just in length like a sausage, but in width and in height. Uh, and note that the regularity of the drawings in the drawing is merely a drawing convention. The nodes can be linked or unlinked, connections between them are long or short. And then here's their um, example of how the lattice could regulate the design of new additions for an existing hospital. This is the planning diagram for the Medical College of Virginia. The lattice is flexible. Weeks and Best wrote that the size and content of the individual elements, as well as the order in which they get built, can be, term be determined by requirements at the time they are built. The hospital can extend beyond its current limits or not. And that's the crucial part still is that it, it, it doesn't specify that things will change. It's if they change. If they remain the same, the hospital will also work in the future. So finally, I want to end with this proposal for a health sciences center in Ottawa from a 1972 master planning exercise. The complex is separated by and connects to roads and parking shown in gray and purple. The modular structure of the clinical buildings, which we saw as a, 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 a visual lattice are now shown here as blue circles. And the shared connections between them are now warped into an indeterminate pale orange form in the center. Uh, the communications linkage system has been abstracted into a simple cross of dotted orange lines. So today I wanted to give you enough impressions that you can recognize that this diagram is a topological crystal. It's a demonstration of the lattice in action. This is in a diagram induced from empirical studies. It deploys both subtle and crude technical distinctions, and it transmogrified parametric design into an artistic practice. The lattice diagram then is neither computation nor metaphor, condensing both mathematics and matter. It makes it possible to envision and even to achieve, I think, by any number of different paths, a multitude of futures. Um, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you, David, for uh, this provocation and um, attempt to problematize the relationship between form and diagrams. Um, looking forward to the conversation. And now uh, the baton is going to uh, Ranjat Singh Daliwal. Ranjat. Thank you so much. I'm gonna try and share my screen. Uh, let's see if this can work. Okay, uh, can you see my screen? 
Okay, I'm just gonna assume everything's all right. Um, unless anyone else tells me. Um, okay, um, uh, first up, um, land acknowledgements. And I was, I'm, I'm actually joining everyone uh, right now uh, from Mexico City. So if you, in the middle of my talk here, uh, the hawker selling tamales or something, just uh, be jealous, don't be, don't freak out. Um, I, um, and I, I, you know, since I find myself here, uh, I wanted to do a land acknowledgement from this city. Um, and it turns out it wasn't um, easy to even access the same kind of records that are easily available for us when we are in the US or Canada, uh, trying to reflect on our relationship with the land and the indigenous communities who have been stewards here. Uh, so instead of actually having a land acknowledgement, I wanted to sort of leave uh, you with the question of who gets to do what kinds of acknowledgement, especially since uh, people, I mean, 55 uh, native languages are spoken here in Mexico City and the most prominent among them being the Vishritari people and their Vishritari language. Uh, but it's not as if those accesses and those recognitions are as easily available to everyone. Uh, and, and, and I just wanted to sort of think about what it means for all of us. Uh, I want to thank the organizers um, uh, to Danielle and Theodora uh, for inviting me. Um, thank you, Olga, for sharing this session. Uh, Gabriela and David for being here. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. I, I must sort of give an overall context. Uh, most of my work lies around thinking about computation and all its different manifestations. Um, and so my book project is actually on rendering um, and I think about the different valences of rendering, including the very prominent one, which is the image making sense that we use it in computer graphics or in computer architecture, uh, but also the sort of planning and diagrammatic sense that we use in both um, art history uh, and architectural history. Um, however, I was sort of, you know, I had given my rendering talks a number of times and I was kind of bored of, bored of it. So I thought I'll present some other part of my research. So today I'm going to be talking about uh, a, a sort of slightly different uh, part of my work. Uh, and in this one, I'm basically looking at some early computer graphics history, I want to say, but it sort of ends up being a history of computing and history of video games and history of speculation and a number of other things, as you'll see. Um, so let me get started. Um, I'm going to start with a video. So this is uh, the MIT science reporter, uh, a guy named John Fitch, who used to sort of do this programming in Boston, uh, going to different parts of MIT and figuring out what they were doing and sort of uh, presenting and making videos for, uh, for a sort of cable news television. Um, and here, I just realized that I haven't actually uh, done the video share with the audio. So I'm gonna have to do that. I'm sorry. Share sound and okay. Well, let's see if we do it now. I ask you how um, big this piece of paper that you keep referring to is is and how many pieces of paper you have available to you? Ah, well, this scope, which measures about seven inches on the side, we regard this as a window that we can move over our paper and, and enlarge the size of this window. We can imagine uh, uh, there's a six sheet of paper behind this window. The scale is approximately two miles on top. Two miles? Uh, let's look at that. I think you finish this design slightly. And let me call up a copy of Mastodon again. Put it over the center there. Oops. I've hit one stop already. That's a small Where are all these papers? Let me magnify it now. And now it's magnified so right away off the screen. Place another one in there. So I put. Picture, picture. Right, it's real nightmare material. 
and then it has an hour, even though it's a clock, so it disappears. Uh, it's very similar, but the computer has its all memorized in its memory. So most of the things are... That's the uh, biggest piece of paper that you can get. Okay. So um, the clip that we just saw was from uh, 1963. It was aired in early 1964 uh, when John Fitch was interviewing a number of people in the MIT Lincoln Lab uh, for a piece on Sketchpad. And he was told to, quote, imagine a two mile long sheet of paper behind the window, end quote. So the visual components of the machine in question, as we saw, were called a real nightmare material. And it must be noted that the screen at this point in history was interestingly not a screen, but a scope. Referring to the oscilloscope, the terminology of the scope brings to fore precisely the experimental speculative engagement with the machine that was a display in the 1960s. And this is kind of the thing that I'm interested in. Um, I mean, note here the sort of clicky sounds, the oops, the, the, the knobs that he's dialing. Uh, as both the object of inquiry and as a medium for one, the scopic valence of the computational apparatus was very explicit in early 1960s. Uh, back then, the window was coded as a movable device for investigating another object, namely the imagined paper behind it. And we have many papers, he says, we. That this two mile long paper behind the window thus functioned in the imaginary as a prototypical inscriptive surface. It's worth pondering on the fact that amidst conversations of drafting implements like rulers and compasses, one of the first ever graphical user interfaces was not solely a, in an inscriptive redimensionalization of you know, the 2D paper slash screen to 3D architectural models, but a machine which had a far more conflicting intellectual genealogy with art historical perspectives, architectural windows, and writing tools all exerting their influence as its predecessors, along with science fiction and playbill Cold War, as I'll come to in a second. For starters, in words of Ivan Sutherland, the creator of Sketchpad, I mean, you know, can't be speaking about early computer graphics without Sketchpad. And, uh, you know, with, with, so in, in words of Sutherland, the apparatus for Inter interaction was then a far more dynamic and adaptive operationalization than a simple representational model of a screen would have us believe. Since the, to the user, the scope is physically there and no sense of body motion goes without the motion of the window, the knobs turn so that the operator thinks of moving the drawing behind his window. Rotation to the right results in the picture motion to the right or up. No such convenient manner of thought, he says, for the scale of knob has been found. Users get used to either sense of change about equally poorly. The major user so far, which is Ivan Sutherland himself, still must try the knob before being sure of which way it turned. So, end quote. This, this insistence on trying until you're sure about what is wrought by our interaction with the machine is indicative of how the scope window metaphor functions. The macroscope operationalizes the window to make it examinable or usable, and the moving window itself lets one imagine the varying scales of dynamically imagined spaces behind the window with the body practices, the, the, the turning the knobs, functioning as experimental cogs in media's race. This imagined space behind the window, which then became critical for subsequent development of computational media, was also very much in the surface of imagination and speculation. And as mentioned before, it was not just that something that followed the kind of Italian Renaissance tradition of making a 2D representation of a 3D world. It relied on the imagination of a space, an imagination that became a physical, literal component of cultural trajectory of media in late 20th century lying hidden in plain sight over the next six decades of computational evolution. So navigating between the phenomenal and the dimensional, even today we speculate sort of implicitly, uh, sort of we, I think I've lost it. Even today we speculate on what lies behind the screen, right? Uh, we say a desktop, a cyberspace, a web page, uh, and all of these sort of metaphors kind of are hidden in our common vocabulary today. And then once we speculate it, we align it with the input devices such as our knobby mice. And we sort of have similar 
uh, sort of bodily grammar of responses as uh, we saw in the clip. Um, and Danielle is right. Uh, the, the person speaking is Timothy Johnson. So uh, the person was not Ivan Sutherland. He was not actually in the, uh, this is Ivan Sutherland, but this is not. Uh, so he was, I, I, I think he was not in the lab the day that the video was recorded. Uh, so you're right. So as windows, scopes, and knobs have proliferated over the years, the role of imagining another space has become critical in human-computer interaction. Much like how the first wave of cybernetic thought relied on steering or navigating the, the cyber, the kyber, human-computer interaction in its early days was about creating an experimental space, one where the imagination of a beyond the window was as much a mental experiment as a physical one. So to illustrate this more concretely, I'm going to go to another related story from early uh, 1960s here. At the same time, this moment in computer history also marked the rise of a certain shared project of speculative interactivity. From Sketchpad, a graphical user interface, to T-Square, one of the first drafting programs, uh, to Space War, a video game, there emerged a mode of communication that did not rely on prefiguring the objects, a sense of experimentation that essentially relied on the computer for the dynamism of the experimental setup itself and not just its calculation. Uh, you know, this is also sort of shift from the tool to medium that we've been talking about in the past couple of days. Uh, Jacob referred to it and I think uh, a bunch of other folks also were talking about it in the last couple of days. Consider the fact that the world's first joystick created for one of the first world's first ever video games, Space War, so this is the joystick on the left, was ported to be a controller for T-Square, one of the world's first ever architectural drafting programs. Allow me to zoom a little bit on this tech transfer. Um, yeah, this is Steve Coons talking about the fact that it's, you know, we, we are making computer to be more than just a calculating machine. Uh, at the outset, you would not know what the problem is and slowly sort of you'll get to know the problem with it. It's sort of seeing with the machine. So uh, we clearly get to hear uh, a lot of sort of science fictional echoes here in, in, in early days of that lab, um, which are also early days uh, of uh, sort of video games and uh, early days of hacking. Um, so, you know, at this time they were crashing and banging their way through Skylark and Lensman novels of E. e. Smith. Um, and almost all of these, you can see a sort of these colonial visions, the overdeveloped hardy boys going tracking off in the universe to punch out the latest gang of galactic goons. Um, and also sort of very much uh, in, in the zone of sort of Cold War era space wars. So what I'm arguing here is that this one tiny corner of early history of computing speaks to how the conceptualization of the computing apparatus in the 1960s was not just linguistic or mathematical, but essentially speculatively spatial. Uh, and this again ties, I think, with uh, Jacob's like whole longer trajectory of pointing out uh, that the computer did not need to be always considered, you know, just mathematical, like the, the fact that our screens have done a lot for how it has developed. So this spatial imaginary bore an experimental model of visual simulation with it. Entangled in the story at T-Square and Space Wars, and in between these characters stands this lost shared interface, uh, the world's first joystick, and only artistic renditions or descriptions of it remain. Uh, anything else that you see, for example, uh, this is the only image that's actually remaining from that on the left one. Um, that can be, you know, it, it looks like it has two buttons, like one button and two sort of controllers, but we don't know much. Uh, it has been described by several people as having three controls, a rotation control, a two function control and a button. Uh, its goal was to mimic the rotation of the spaceship clockwise and counterclockwise, the acceleration controls of the rocket and a missile launching switch. It is in many ways a custom device built by and for gamers who wanted to alleviate the elbow problems that came with hours of playing space war on a control console that was placed next to instead of in front of the screen of PDP-1. So they would stand on the left 
uh, of PDP-1 and try to sort of uh, play the game, which was not positioned in front of them, but on the sides. And so the elbows would start painting after like eight hour gaming sessions. So why then, one may ask, was it so easily ported to be a controller for one of the first, world's first ever architectural drafting programs, created uh, partially by the same team? Alan Kotok and Peter Sampson uh, from MIT worked on both the projects. So what undergirds, I ask, this science fictional dream of popular space operas and the functionality of computer architectural designs? To answer this question, we may have to turn to the shared values and virtues the kind of epistemic virtues, as Lorian Daston might say, of early 1960s computing labs, where these technologies and Sutherland's sketchpad were all born. It should be noted that Space War was first conceptualized as a display hack, a kind of demonstration program that would show off and stretch the technical resources in an interesting and an interactive manner. But there's like a duality to that display hack, right? On the one hand, it is a hack that you can display. Uh, and on the other, it is a hack of displaying itself. Uh, and I think that's the kind of key duality that I'm pointing out here. As Colin Milburn describes it, for this group of engineers, uh, science fiction was theory and hacking was the practice. More specifically, their science fiction was not just any science fiction, it involved a mode of speculation that imagined a space, a space for adventure, for lawlessness, for heroic colonial visions. It was quite literally the outer space as a frontier. This practice, that of imagining the space as an extension of the machine in front of you, was not limited to its kind of most explicit instantiation in space war. The science fictional dreams of popular colonial Cold War space operas and the functionality of computational architectural design here all traveled through coterminous interaction design paradigms. There was no longer any need to write out all the steps of a ritual on a typewriter or in punch card forms as, a, as the quote from Stipoon shows, for the pre-programmed algorithm had now been subsumed by the interactive interface. This experimental space opened up by the real-time interactive and imaginative computing harbored a techno-scientific experimental vision of the operational aesthetic to use the art historian Neil Harris's term one where the imagined space is equal parts suspending the disbelief and relying on it. In other words, literally a new way of seeing, not just through, but with a machine, not just into, but with a machine. Seen in this light, Space Wars apparatus for spatial navigation, literally the trajectories of spaceships and buttons for shooting in the outer space, then become a point of origin for a specific kind of human computer interaction that preserved the original relationship between the user and this horizon that lay on the other side, the other wild side. From design to play, there was a through line that foreground and imagined experimental interactive space at the base of the history of computational media, one that coexisted and intersected with the well-known inscriptive agencies of the machine. Historically, Computational media has been generally seen as mathematical in essence and visual only as a convenience. But I argue that this glimpse into the early 60s treatment of computing shows that spatial contiguity and concerns around visual analogies were important sites for the development of computing as we know today. This convergence of technical and rhetorical practices introducing spatial visual elements into early graphical computing systems calls for a visual historical critique of computing technologies to help us better understand how the computer as a medium can manipulate social, material, and conceptual spaces. Um, and this has also been a theme of uh, some of my other work where I try uh, tie, for example, the history of computing to the long history of addresses uh, in sort of physical spaces in cities um, and, and, and show how addressability in computing is an extension of and a modification of uh, an addressability in urban spaces that has kind of already existed uh, at least since early 1700s. Um, so the goal here is to really think about computation as a play of earmarking spaces, uh, first and foremost. That is only sort of technological as a second, uh, a second order phenomena. Um, and so, you know, I, I go there to sort of 
Althusser and Foucault and uh, Deleuze sort of lay those things out. And I'm happy to talk more about that here um, in, in Q&A. But what I want to point out about the, the, the questions around spatiality and computation is that we can look at how spaces get configured around computers and inside computers, but around is more easily visible for us. Uh, you know, think about computer rooms in high schools of 1990s. Think about these labs, the sort of physical orientation of where these guys were and how the fact that they were on the left and their elbows pained uh, needed, may, meant that they had to create the first joystick. Um, think about, you know, the VR cafes today and what kind of sort of spatialities they embody. And, and looking at all of these spaces lets us interrogate and seek alternatives to the ways in which computing infrastructures influence our contemporary moment, socially, perceptually, environmentally, political, economically, epistemically. As Donna Haraway and Jonathan Quarry remind us, the techniques of vision are never neutral. So if an imagined space behind the surface is so important for the very functioning of computational paradigm, what speculations are the speculative media today enabling and disabling? What can we imagine that will make inroads in what we see that which for Haraway is a social, quote, struggle over how to see. What emerges from speculating on the spaces of our speculative media? Thank you. Thank you, Ranjot. Um, wonderful, wonderful talk. So, um, I have to admit that I have difficulty synthesizing these three conversations. Um, I had this idea that maybe it's three different sites, is the laboratory, the home, and the hospital, which are sites, as Tithi Bhattacharya says, of social reproduction in a way. But I have, I'm a little bit um, hesitant to force on you an STS, an STS kind of question, even though I really do want to. So uh, before opening it to uh, the questions in the audience, I just want um, to let me entertain this question for all three of you, and then we'll uh, jump into other questions. Um, so Donna Haraway makes this argument that um, all knowledge is situated, right? And in order to uh, be able to understand things that happen, we need to like really situate the object in this case or the video or the production. Um, so I wanted you to entertain this thought for a minute and um, think about your own case studies, the lattice, the, the screen, right, and um, the animation, and think and consider what do we learn by situating the production of your key studies within their social and political context? What do we learn about gender or neocolonial drives behind uh, computer animations or the body in the hospital, the medicalized uh, body in the hospital? Um, I don't know, it's kind of a big and relatively vague question, but if one of you could start sketching an answer, uh, then we can pick it up from there. Or maybe I should say, I should be like the professor. Okay, Gabriella, I want, I want to start with you because I have like affinity with the feminist project. So I would really like to know what is it that happens? What is feminist about this work? Even though I know that Elizabeth van der Zag is here, so <laughs> she can also like chime in. <laughs> Oh, I, I can I can try to 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 respond. I, I think that um, I, I'm I'm basically what I'm trying to to understand is what is the the social milieu, the the cultural milieu that allows um, the artists that I'm interested in investigating to start um, um, playing, experimenting uh, with these technologies that were being developed in both um, universities and they're also being brought by different exchanges. So it is a very situated um, 
in Vancouver, a very um, particular context in which um, Elizabeth and, um, and Karen Henry are being able to get to learn about technology. And I am very interested in, 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 in establishing or looking at the dialogue between their experiments, the way they appropriate technology, the way they use it, and they mix a lot of um, I mean, I'm, I'm fascinated by the, the experimentation of Elizabeth when she um, records things from the computer, she's at SFU, she's tinkering with cracks, she's uh, playing uh, with the, the systems that um, Barry Tracks is developing, she's really interested in, 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 in experimenting with sound and using those systems as well. So it is very situated and I'm, I'm trying to, to understand how they are um, influencing each other. Um, and how this, particularly the role of artist run centers in enabling the learning of technology outside a university and, and the opportunities that uh, both Elizabeth and Karen had. Um, they, they were writing, I mean, when, when you look at the writings at the video guide, they were, um, they were writing about technology that was coming in. They were explaining it to, to all the Canadian audience. So I, I find that, um, that's that's fascinating and and very situated in both of my conversations and i i, I should tell um let um, elizabeth speak about this um neither of them uh, really define themselves as feminist or as feminist activists but i think that um i look at the work from a feminist lens because i think that what they were doing the practice of horizontality the uh, commitment in, in teaching, using, experimenting, and mentoring, uh, that is, uh, to me, uh, um, a model of, of world making that is situated, that is more horizontal than a more patriarchal, um, you know, vertical structure. Um, so that's how I understand their practice as feminist. Um, so. This is actually particularly helpful because the next question was going to be about the rhetoric of the image and how like the feminist belief <laughs> renders in the rhetoric of the image. But it, it is very good that you're situating the feminist practice as the practice of the production, a different model for the production of video art. It's, it's a, an amazing clarification. Um, Ranjot? Just unsettling the series of, uh, you know, who comes first? Uh, no, I'm, uh, I'm happy to be taken by surprise because I think in fact that's, um, that would be my entry point in the question is to sort of go from the present uh, and then sort of turn back into situatedness step by step. So the central problem that I see uh, in my story is one of the kinds of speculation. So a large part of critical discourse and popular discourse today um, really, you know, argues or sort of thinks with how thinking otherwise itself can be a liberatory uh, practice. Uh, so, you know, speculation and uh, is, is, is a central part of, say, Afrofuturism or a number of different sort of imaginative practices that imagine the world differently today. And I think one of the things that sort of going back into this history and situating uh, my own work in MIT in early 1960s and specifically these three rooms does is that it kind of shows that maybe we need to be a little bit more careful about those alternate imaginations because most alternate imaginations are really bad. Uh, like, you know, the, the, the actors that I am following, uh, these pioneers um, were also some of the world's first hackers and were, were also uh, people who were really genuinely trying to sort of, you know, create these games that were, that were not existing before. Uh, and so, uh, which, which relied on this sort of uh, imagining otherwise the surface behind the machine. Um, so I guess that's a, that's a convoluted way of saying that I, I do genuinely follow the distinction between formative and affirmative speculation that uh, uh, uncertain comments lay out for us. 
uh, and by situating it in an area where the same actors over and over again show up with these normative visions of the world as it was in early 1960s, more specifically, uh, you know, with the Cold War raging and money flowing in from the Department of Defense for these developments. Uh, it's, it's, it's tough for me to not think about the situatedness and see that there were more people named John Eckert than women or people of color in the archives that I was visiting, right? And John Eckert is not even a name that like, I, I know anyone who's named John, no, I don't. Uh, but my, that's my point is that I think situating them within the actors that, uh, that, that are acting in my story lets me sort of, will sort of put some breaks on what kinds of uh, speculations and what kinds of spatialities emerge, uh, even from these really, not really, but somewhat unorthodox ways of operation and interaction. And uh, David, with fear, because I know you're a great provocateur, so I'm waiting to see what you will do there. It's not nice to call someone a provocateur. You need to call sure. them deeply gifted. I like you, like it's that. obvious. <laughs> um, and yeah, I, I mean, I just find the idea of situated knowledge deeply frustrating and uh, not very helpful at all. So I, I don't. I mean, that's the trap to try to get out of. Of course, it's socially constructed. Everything is. Then what do you do with it? Uh, how do you tell which situation matters in which situation? You can't just use your own guide points because then you're obviously missing things. It's a really thorny question for a cultural analysis, for any of the interpretive scientists, sciences. Uh, anthropologists went through this a couple of decades ago, trying to figure out if they could you know, turn it into a science somehow. Um, economics is still going through the problem of statistics today. Like, it's a deep, deep problem. And I don't think we get around it just by situating our characters in their en environments. Um, it, it just doesn't, that's the beginning, not the, the goal. All right, so I'll, I'll attempt a pushback there. Because you, uh, you guys all, no, not all, apart from Gabriela, uh, so Ranjot and David, you, Ranjot more explicitly, so you speak about speculation. And when I think of, um, when I think of speculation, I think in terms of economics or land or development, right? So I think in, in these terms. And I was wondering, David, uh, and maybe you can discuss a little bit more how you understand speculation as a term through which we can rethink processes, right? Because in process, there is like a planning involved as well. Um, but I was thinking, what was it that made this hospital architect move from the horizontal model to the vertical? Like, why did they do that? I, th I know you're giving an answer, David, but I think speculation is part of that answer even in ways of like um, taking into consideration the relationship that these hospitals have with land. Like in Boston, for example, there was a whole like displacement project that took place in order to have the hospital designed there. So I, I just wanted to like push back a little bit on your suggesting that this is like a thorny issue, the situating knowledge that maybe there is something more there. I don't know if you make that. No, that, that's, that's, um, it, it's, it's, you're right. And it's difficult to respond to. I mean, there's no such thing as verticality without an elevator in a hospital. And a lot of work went into figuring out how that vertical system would work. Um, right from the invention, right from the end of the 19th century into the 1970s. And that's what I'm getting at, that, that it's a historical development. Like there's, 80 years of work about it. It's, it's not just that they thought up this thing, it, like they were working with um, from a history, which is not just a context. It's not just a situation that they were dealing with. Um, so in order to have verticality, you had to assume that there were elevators <laughs> and they, they, the hospital architects had nothing to do with inventing elevators or perfecting the systems or any of those kinds of things. They're part of, our, part of what was available for them to use. Um, 
it's it's just a complicated thing to try to explain as uh, as if you as if we could explain it and understand it. I just don't know where understanding what an elevator is really makes you understand what they're doing. But if you don't understand what an elevator is, my whole story doesn't make any sense. So do, like, you know, is it turtles all the way down and we need to describe every single turtle so that we have some kind of way to communicate exactly what was going on? That doesn't make any sense. At some point you have to jump in and then we're back into some kind of hermeneutic circle. And do we really wanna go back into the hermeneutic circle? Probably not and so on. Uh, what is the technical? Where does it start? It has a history. Um, it's not simply uh, started in an MIT lab. Um, it's just not. So where do you want to start it and how do you want to do it? And then you go philosophy, you see? <laughs> I just, I don't, I, I'm really in, in my ship in the middle of the ocean, having set off from situated knowledge to somewhere else. And I don't see the land yet. And I, if you if you know where the land is without going back to situated knowledge, I'd love to hear more about that. If Gabriella or Randolph had a suggestion, um, you know, just orient my compass a little bit. I think that would be really helpful. I don't want to take too much time with my question. I see here that there is um, there are a couple of questions from the audience, but there is a very lively conversation between Leslie, uh, Medzi, and Gabriella. And I was wondering if you two would like to take this conversation, like um, bring us in this conversation that you're having. Okay, uh, am I on? Uh, so. I just noticed that uh, uh, that Gabriel, one of Gabriel's slides showed Sarah uh, Diamond in 1984 at the video inn. And I asked her whether that was the, the one who became president of OCAD uh, University of Design in Toronto. And she said yes. And I pointed out that Bill Buxton, who I brought to uh, to Canada and was my student for a little while. Uh, uh, got an honorary PhD from there, especially because he was saying that we were not just systems analysts, but system designers, and often without being aware of being designers, and that we that we uh, each time we put new systems into society, we are really redesigners of society. And that uh, a lot of uh, Buxton's work since has been about design. He, for example, pointed out that Apple's great success was really because they had some real design disciplines and they used design that way. Gabriella? Yes. Uh, well, well I, I was, I'm not uh, very familiar with, uh, or right now, um, thinking about Bill Buxton, but I'm, um, I'm trying to understand. Um, I do think that uh, um, design has a very important role to play. And uh, it obviously, everything that we design uh, has an impact in the way we conduct ourselves. We, um, we we change our behavior. I mean, the way which we cannot um, not recognize the way that we move our hands now because of the way we use tablets or interfaces. And that's just a very tiny, tiny, minimal example. So um, I, I'm, I was just trying to figure out what were you saying if you were in agreement or disagreement with, with this. I, I, do, I do believe that, um, you know, design has, has an, a very impactful role to play in society. Uh, and I just always think about the, the early cybernetics program that was put in place in Chile, uh, yeah. you know, that, uh, to, 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 to um, manage economics, right? And so we're thinking about, again, situated knowledges about how certain problems, uh, programs design, and this was a huge uh, systems design that included, you know, factory management, architecture, uh, land, uh, um, you know, land usage um, in a time when, you know, when um, um, 
Chile was to, trying to implement new social programs and, and uh, they brought really interesting people over to, to oversee those issues. So, um. That's fascinating. In fact, Stafford Beer, who yes. did that, became a friend here in Toronto and uh, uh, gave that wonderful CBC lecture that's still available about that. The reason I'm mentioning Buxton is what he keeps telling us is that most people who do these new systems have no idea about design. They're not aware that they're designers. And so now we have to update that to artificial intelligence because it's so much in, as I mentioned uh, uh, yesterday, it is now so much in to rush into doing things with artificial intelligence uh, that without the design disciplines of what's what's an appropriate way of doing things, what are the potential side effects, and so on. So, so this is such an important topic. Buxton has a book. I forget uh, its title, but the word design is in it somewhere. Okay. Well, it would be interesting to know, like, if uh, the characters that you all of you are interrogating, are thinking of themselves as designers or art. So how do they identify? Gabriela, if you want to start. Uh, oh, um, I don't know. I mean, we could ask Elizabeth, she's here. I don't know how she feels about being uh, um, her own identification, but I, I can share that I, I do work in a, in, a, in a university program where we have designers and artists um, and engineers and we all use the word design to talk about ourselves and it's been um, I have a background in design and arts and um, and design thinking tends to be the main uh, methodology that we used uh, there are as an artist as a humanist I have a certain reservations of doing that um, um, so I but I do understand the, the, the power that design has in our society. Um, so I would like to um, bring it back to Leslie or to Rand, Joel and David to, to think about um, why do they think uh, design is so important and what would art and for example, the messiness that we see in the experimentation and the more free a process oriented work that the artists in the artist run centers, um, the way that they approach technology, what can we learn for those? Um, also an iter iterative process and, and ways of thinking, but there are more messy and can we call them design? Hmm. I can take a stab at that. Um, I think for for my story, the, the, the actors that I'm following I don't think explicitly think of themselves as designers, even though design as uh, a verb and a noun shows up pretty often in their correspondences and in their uh, in their papers and you know, dissertations and stuff of that sort. So it's 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 a weird um, it's a weird world, which I think in some ways is is uh, just an early marker of uh, a kind of technological culture uh, that has, you know, continued over, over, um, over decades, where the, the, the functions and the applications of the, the machines that you develop or that you work with or either work on um, are in some ways left as uh, an exercise for the reader as, as, as like a, as an afterthought in some ways, right? So in this case, uh, they consider themselves hackers. They definitely consider themselves artists. If someone comes and says, what you've done here is art, as was one of the questions that was raised in early uh, gaming, you know, history is like, is this, uh, you know, what are, you, what are we doing here? Like, how is this different from uh, other forms of sort of video interfacing that have, have been happening with cinema. It, it, where, where, where is this located in this nexus? Um, they're, they're happy to sort of take on any uh, tag that can be offered, but I don't think they claim uh, many of these tags themselves. And I think there is something in there which may be useful for the way we think about the history of digital art, 
because it, it kind of shows you that it really doesn't need to be tagged as such for it to be uh, it, for it to be experimental, for it to be producing new things and new ways of thinking and new ways of seeing. Um, and I think that just to me sort of blurs the distinction if there was any uh, between the experimentation as we think aesthetically, experimental novels, experimental, um, you know, video experimental games, uh, experimental art, and experiments as we think scientifically or techno-scientifically, uh, you know, a, a, a slightly more controlled version with, uh, as, as the history of science and technology shows. Um, and I, I, I think this was the, the early computing history, uh, early cybernetics, all these like are excellent locations where those boundaries blur so wonderfully that we can ask ourselves uh, if, uh, if there are ways of sort of uh, recapitulating that, you know, that, that zone of having different kinds of people in the room and making things that do not fall under these neat, easy categories. I mean, you know, we've since then been grappling with the question of are video games art? Uh, useless question, just because, I mean, were they ever art or do you ever want them to be art? I, I don't know, it, it, I don't think it really matters. Uh, but I think the sense of play does matter. And I think that's what is the sort of big takeaway for me from this entanglement in this story. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Well, there's this field of HCI, human computer interaction. And uh, yes, it's wonderful that uh, we can do some, uh, some things spontaneously, artistically, although the, uh, uh, although the, uh, the input of visual material is still difficult. Uh, what I, what I'm talking about is when we establish systems, that requires the design, it requires other things too. I think one of the things I worry about is that we have not really learned in this HCI world, in this systems design world, uh, uh, some of the lessons from cybernetics, like Stafford Beer wanted to do. There's another, uh, another thing we used to talk about, general systems theory, understanding how systems work together and so on. I think these things haven't caught on nearly as much as I hoped in those times. I had this interdisciplinary course with both art and science students uh, talking about these things. But uh, I think that some of these things could be used more to understand better what it is we are creating. because. The, the next step in, I, I don't know where the next, but eventually the, where HCI is going to go is that we're going to be connected to the, to the computers directly from our brains. And we better, we better be careful in what we're going to allow those, those machines to do to us while they're doing things with us. Wonderful. David, do you want to, well, not wonderful, but like, David, do you want to, to <laughs> <laughs> add something uh, before we move into the, uh, the questions uh, in the chat? Because there are a couple of questions that are very interesting in the chat as well. Let's just go to the chat. I thought those were good answers. So. Yeah. Okay. So Moa is asking, particularly David, um, are these models diagrams part of the standardization program prompted by the 1962 hospital plan for England and Wales? Uh, sh short answer is sort of. So when the plan was brought in, Weeks and his uh, firm, Llewellyn Weeks Davis, were, had done uh, functional studies for the design of hospitals. Uh, and there were a couple of others that Theodora and I have been looking at. So there was a massive amount of data available because of private agencies that had been investigating hospitals when the hospital plan was developed. And Northwick Park, uh, the one that has the structural mullions on the facade, was the first uh, hospital to combine a clinical research center with a general hospital ever uh, in Britain. And that was directly out of that, that um, set of data that they had worked on before. Except that Richard Llewellyn Davis, who um, is this kind of very strange, well, strange is the wrong word. He was famously, um, 
schooled at home and his teacher at home was um, Alfred Russell. So imagine that you have <laughs> the writer of Principia Mathematica teaching you at home. And so the story of how they got uh, Norfolk Park as a, as a hospital to design is more of a story about him competing with his social peers than it is anything about how the government should be handing out things. A very familiar political story. So that's kind of, um, the quick answer is yes. Uh, Theodore and I have looked a little bit about and may do more about the, the various kinds of computer systems that were being developed. But he, Weeks himself, was not trying to build a, a computer system to design a hospital. Um, yeah, and then the final part of that is the other part of it was you also now had to make space in the hospital for computers, which is a slightly different problem than using them, but really also changed uh, the, the structure and organization of the hospitals. Um, David, um, David, if you're still with us, do you want to ask your question? I feel weird just being the voice of other people. Are you, are you talking to me? Yes, yes. <laughs> oh, we have two David. Um, oh yeah, that's true, yeah. Some, I, I don't know if you're referring to the earlier thing I said, there was more of an observation is, it seemed like the, the, using this sort of technical sort of, I don't want to say male construct, they were basically kind of creating a rhizomatic system of some sort by, by and sort of a bio design approach without even kind of um, by using technical approach, but really, um, and by use, by talking about Darcy Thompson and the idea of growth and change, um, brings in nature into the whole system. Then, I mean, where we are now with bio design, I don't know if that's clear. So it is kind of clear. You must have been the reviewer on one of my articles who didn't like that I said rhizomatic, but um, that no, I is. Wasn't. I don't know. I don't <laughs> No, I like Bryce, I like it. Oh, okay. no, I think it's good. No, I think that's what's good is they didn't even know what, my thing is, is because of their, their methodology, they were not even seeing this other side, I think, even though it was influencing them um, of these other elements. I don't know to what degree the basis for their methodology was, but it seems more technical or, well, this is partly what I mean by rhetoric. If they're addressing a technical audience, they're going to put it in technical terms with lots of numbers and graphs. If they're addressing the artists, they're going to build some things out of, you know, styrofoam and paint and wheels and use that. They were they were very adroit and they moved easily between artistic and technical and medical circles. So it just depends which things you read, I think, as to whether or not they were conversant with the um, the vocabulary and the expected references and so on in each situation. Um, so I don't know. Um, the part of the reason I showed the this is tomorrow stuff is that they they obviously were were not addressing hospital designers when they were making you know brick walls with holes in them. It's very hard to convince a, a hospital building board that you're a good architect if you make a brick wall with lots of holes in it. So. They, they knew what they were doing in terms of switching modes. Um, the terms we were using just a minute ago was design and art, but they were also involved with operations research, which was this way of thinking about systems that came out of the, uh, became famous, let's say, during the Second World War. You know, how do you get supplies in deep behind enemy lines, that kind of thinking. Oh, and uh -huh. it turns out that you could, for example, design a hospital waiting room if you went to a hairdressing salon and saw how they did it, because, you know, you only had to wait like 15 minutes in a hairdressing salon where you could be waiting all day in a hospital waiting room. So why don't we use the methods that they did in the hairdressing salon to design how we organize and um, the, the hospital waiting room? So that's not technical, really, but it, it is based in the mathematics of operations research. So nimble... But it's also looking at people, how people um, work in, that, in these sort of social systems efficiently without even by just naturally finding the most appropriate way. Well, it could be natural, but th there's, anyway, I, 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 I'm agreeing. I, I'm just saying that uh, the, the you have, we, we have to be careful to 
to try to nail down what they were doing because they were doing many things in many different registers at many different times. Right. I just want to say one bit of irony. This is sort of off subject. I went to Cal Arts, and the joke about Cal Arts is it was really not designed to be an art school. It was designed to be a hospital, and um, that when it failed as an art school, it'd be turned into a hospital. <laughs> There's lots. We have the Université de Montréal, um, beautiful building by one of Quebec's um, most celebrated architects that was designed as a hospital before the Second World War, didn't open and opened after the war as a university. So <laughs> it happens. Rancho, do you Thank have you. a question? Yeah, I, it was more in, uh, I guess it's a question for David uh, and in response to some of the conversations that we've been having. I mean, firstly, David, I think uh, um, at the at the risk of being wrong, I, I see a lot of situatedness in your story. Uh, I think it's it's granular. It's you know you're talking about these. I I I, I do see it kind of doing that sort of work really well, even if you don't see it yourself doing it. Which made me wonder that all these like kind of messiness, uh, all this all this messiness that you're talking about, all these. Uh, actors that have different rhetoric for different audiences uh, and are interfacing with these uh, different discipline mechanisms and uh, cliques and whatnot. Do you see sort of any kind of broader patterns emerge in sort of vectors of power one way or the other? Um, or is it all just always messy? Like, you know, was there some uh, driving forces like some institutional or political economic or other rhetorics that were more important and show consistently regardless of which audience is being spoken to than the others? Or was it always just like subtle negotiations? Uh, you know, there was no sort of big economic agenda or big, I don't know, I'm just wondering if you have, uh, you have a bird's eye view that's not situated in this case that you can present for us. So, uh... That's a, a very good way to put it. The granularity is a kind of um, default mode. I think it, it, that's just how I was trained and how I continue to think. And I, the reason that I got trained that way when I was trained, if I'm trained, was this question that the, the bigger explanations just weren't uh, ever coming down to the level of uh, ex explanation. So they could help you understand in a certain kind of way. But what, what people wanted to do was to be able to explain, and that's part of that attitude that you need to predict in some kind of way. And if you have the right explanation about the past, you can predict the future. Uh, and I, I don't know that that's true for many of my examples. Uh, and the, the story today was about how you get around that problem, which is with this, this um, what is it, a machine, a technical object, a, something that, that can doesn't have to predict the future for it to function well and still frame meaning and frame experience and all those kinds of things. Uh, so if that's true, I think that's a, a really, really good invention. Um, but as, as your stories say about the video gaming, like there's, a, there's a whole part of um, being formed by, by, let's call it, I don't know, how do we divide up cultures? There was a question from Matthew Allen in the chat about subcultures. And I, I think Gabriella as well, that was one of my hesitations at the beginning. It's very true that if you tell the story from the experience of a certain group of people in a certain place, you don't get to the general story that we want to tell as the general story. So you know, do we, does, does that just multiply our stories and we're fine with that? Then Ranjad, your question, like, don't you don't you want to tell more stories? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, that makes sense. I think there's a there's a there's always a subtle uh, sort of dance, uh, a negotiation that you have to do between these scales for it to make any sense. Uh, and so, you know, I I, I don't think these uh, methodological questions ever resolve completely. But that's 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 a really useful way of thinking about it. So thank you. Yeah, Ga uh, Gabriela, did you want to talk? <laughs> so yeah, I, um, I'm trying to. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm really understanding what David just uh, talked about between general, gen, um, 
talk about generalities and granularity and, and the, the, the dichotomies uh, with that. I do think it's very important, at, at least um, I'm very committed and in, 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 in building a situated histories and knowledges as alternatives to the universal, to the general, because there's a lot of silences created and there's a, there's a very um, dominant you know, narrative that tells us how things are, but then we don't look at the sides. And so I'm not trying to undo the dominant or the universal, uh, well, I am trying, but I'm not trying to, to, to erase it. I'm trying to show that there is similar simultaneity of thought and simultaneity of shared experiences in different geographies and at, in the same in the same temporality that we're dealing with the same questions and that they should they were also um, engaging with, with with the same issues that were happening. Um, um, I, so that's that's kind of my my interest in situated knowledge and the knowledge is, and I do think that it's very important to um, to show simultaneity of thought. Um, to not uh, create, you know, meta narratives, um, and create uh, actually, as somebody said, counter narratives too, right? How other people are countering this, this, this uh, dominant ideas. Um, I, I, but I actually wanted to um, to go back to uh, Leslie's question and and maybe maybe put Elizabeth on the spot a little bit, if if I may, because I'm really I just I was thinking about Arthur Drucker's um, quote. Uh, where he uh, really sets up um, the quote that frames the exhibition that I'm talking about. It sets up a binary between artists and engineers, between art and design, about the way they're dealing with technology. And uh, as as I and I know that the the purpose of this exhibition was to show artists that were playing, experimenting, uh, roughing up the technology that was being developed by the engineers. <laughs> And, and somebody that's actually having a, a foot in both worlds is Elizabeth because she was um, involved in the laboratories where uh, Tom Calvert was working and they were developing racks and they were developing racks as part of a system that wanted to simulate reality, uh, simulate reality in a real way. And she grabs the, the, the animation program and kind of brings it into the art space and completely messes it up or you know, creates her own personal, very situated relationship with animation, with her digital construct. So I am interested in the blurring of both worlds uh, 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 rather than creating those binaries. And that's why I'm interested in, in Elizabeth's work. So I don't know if you want to say something about that, Elizabeth, about your experience in working on both places at the same time. Well, I, I just think, I think that all of these things are languages. And, uh, you know, so far the narrative, the language has been dominated in my history <clears throat> of being in this technology field, the, the history was, the, the, the language was really dominated in a certain way. And all I'm trying to do in my work is try to expand that language to sort of include most of our humanity, more of our humanity. So that's basically, maybe that's feminist, or maybe it's just more personal, or maybe it's more abstract, I'm not sure. So it's a language to me, it doesn't matter so far, it's been very limited what's being said. And as we design things, we keep limiting it more. Like I think texting is the most limited communication device we've ever invented, yet that's what we're doing. So I think that we constantly have to, as humans, look to force the boundaries and push it out there further. And that's what my thing is, yeah. Thanks. This is really wonderful because I have been writing on a little bit and researching Lillian uh, Schwartz. And it's very interesting to see how there is this, um, even like in interpretations of her work later on, there is this big question of um, who is the master of the computer, hence who is the artist? Is the artist or the computer engineers who should get the credit? And complicating these ideas of authorship and uh, creative process is so very important work to be done. So Elizabeth, thank you for doing this work along all the other heroines. Um, I think we have 10 more minutes. I want to go to Theodora's uh, question, which I have been, uh, I haven't been um, indulging, but it is a question that is close to this idea of speculation, obsolescence, temporality, and how processes address this question. So Theodora, if you want to ask your very open-ended question, as you said. Yeah, it was a bit open-ended, a bit lazy, but I think it might be productive to kind of think about it. So I'm just uh, um, curious about 
uh, yeah, if you could all think about the, the kind of notion of future in, in your work and attitudes towards the future. Uh, I'm thinking, for instance, that um, in David's work, like I'm wondering, I mean, maybe I'm reading into it, but there's kind of both a, an idea about uncertainty and kind of anxiety, but also the future as a project as something that can be sort of like planned and figured out, a kind of desire to not hyper control, but in a way, as a way to um, avoid situations where the future will um, create kind of chaos and, you know, things will break and things will not work. Uh, and then, I don't know, in, in, in Gabriela, in your work, like I'm wondering if, if there's kind of a pessimistic or an almost kind of optimistic project of like a future that includes includes is more inclusive or or a kind of like technology that gets reconfigured to um to become something else than what it is so a kind of like transformative idea and Ranjot you obviously talked a lot about fiction and speculation and I was wondering about that as well again it's a uh, I'm hoping that you will interpret my question in ways that are better than the ways that I'm asking it, but uh, there it is, yeah. Um, no one wants to go. <laughs> should I? Uh, should I quickly go? Um, I, I, I tend to be very pessimistic, but I'm going to be optimistic. Um, and I think that uh, the way technology is developing, it's, it's very scary. Um, it's, um, you know, thinking, you know, I think Olga mentioned Ruth Benjamin's work and, uh, and all the um, various scholars that are looking at the harms produced by AI and the discrimination and um, the ways that um, technology um, shapes us, um, it's, it's scary. But I also like to, to think on the resilience of humans um, and the non-human in shaping and managing the world. <laughs> and so I always, when, since we're a bunch, uh, there's a lot of architects and designers here, I like to think of uh, Oscar Nahmeyer's uh, project in Brasilia and, um, and uh, how utopian and, and well-designed and completely non-situated was <laughs> for its context in which the, the city of Brasilia was then designed and implemented. And, and, you know, and if you don't have, haven't been there or I've had the opportunity to be there a couple of times and how people are taking over the design and making the design theirs. And, and just like, you can think that they're, um, you know, completely reworking what Oscar Niemeyer planned. So, you know, one thing is what the systems, uh, design uh, does, and then there's a messiness of our human, humanness and non-humanness that takes over. Um, so I don't know if that makes sense, but it's a very open-ended response to that I like. Well, that's great. I mean, the question was a little bit, I mean, that's that's fantastic, but I mean, I guess I, I was asking more about the kind of subjects that, that you're researching and their attitudes, but it's also obviously crucial to hear your attitudes as historians uh, uh, and and how you feel that the, the stories that you're writing um, create certain possibilities or close others. Yeah, yeah I, I was, uh, you know, waiting for Gabriela to go first just because I wanted to hear precisely uh, which of, how you were drawing out those orientations towards futures yourself from uh, the historical subjects that you were studying. So this was this was actually really helpful because it's in some ways it kind of syncs with how uh, my work sort of considers uh, the future. I, I work on speculation and speculative media uh, a lot. Um, I work on contemporary AI technologies. Um, in fact, um, as as I think we were discussing a couple of days ago, um, a part of my work deals with how computer graphics. Uh, at least from 1980s onwards, had sort of reified a kind of vision of computation, a very technical vision of computation that kind of gets re-inscribed and reinforced to a point where today uh, most of our calculations happen on graphical apparatuses instead of graphical apparatuses being this like extra thing that you add on top. Um, so 
So I think in that regard, uh, the, the, the question of futures becomes for me uh, uh, an important one that does not get resolved in, 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 in normative sense without being able to locate it. So my actors are all, all supremely optimistic. Uh, you know, humans are about to go to space. They're going to land on the moon. Uh, Cold War is glorious. So everyone's really happy with uh, more frontiers in space exploration in my world. Um, and when it comes to sort of me looking back at it and writing about it or talking about it, um, it's, it's hard not to be cynical from the place that you're writing from, from the world that you're writing from. Um, and I think it's, it's important to note that I have written versions of the same thing with far more cynical and far less cynical uh, undertones. And most of that ends up being a rhetorical practice. I think the, the central question is, is, is the praxis part of it, which is to say, where do we draw lines and say, no, these futures are, they, are, they may be imaginable, but they're too easily imaginable. And that's why uh, we should be rejecting them, right? So the, uh, the, the, the sort of legendary Jameson misquote, the, it's easier to imagine the end of uh, the world than it is to imagine the end of capitalism is, is, is kind of sort of my thumb rule for uh, thinking about how easy it is to imagine futures that are as broken or nearly uh, far more broken than the one that uh, is in our present or in the past that we are studying. Um, the tougher task is to uh, imagine, but more importantly, to act on uh, the, 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 the speculations that are not easily available. And that was the distinction that I was drawing early on by saying that um, most speculations are really bad. Uh, most speculations are formative uh, and um, they, they, they reify the past in ways that uh, we need to, I, I don't know. Um, I, Gustavo has uh, uh, questions. I think policy, yes. Um, but those are, those, are, those are also, you know, limitations, think tanks, perhaps not. I'm, I'm, uh, I was, I was uh, recently reading a lot of uh, think tank aesthetics uh, and thinking about how think tanks, maybe not, I don't know. Um, but this, you know, this, if, if that's a million dollar question if we are billion or trillion, or maybe not putting a dollar amount on it is better for that question. Um, how, do we, how do we imagine uh, better futures? But what I do know is that we cannot imagine better futures the way people in the past, in, in the past that I'm studying, have imagined their futures. Uh, those were pretty broken. David? Yeah, um, so I, the actors in my story are a diverse group of people in multidisciplinary teams dealing with uh, as broad a public as possible because they're working on public buildings. So to characterize them in one way or the other would, would, would simply be to make something up about them. I, I just, there isn't an attitude that they have that, that, that I could summarize. Um, and then to change it a little bit to this question of technology slash design slash art. Again, I just think there are different registers. So um, one of them would be this thing that in, um, in architecture, for example, you, you know, it doesn't matter if the roof leaks, falling water was very leaky. And that doesn't make it bad architecture. It still uh, has all the attributes that make it um, this kind of icon of 20th century architecture. Uh, but if you're designing an airplane and it leaks, you have a problem. So you, you need to see design differently when you're designing certain things than when you're designing other things. So this question of what design can do and where again, I think is, is a situated question. It, it does certain things in certain places that are really bad and certain things in certain places that are really good. And yeah, there's lots of bad speculations. There's lots of bad design. It's, you can't just pick and choose. You have to give it a try and be open towards the future. So the role of art in all of that is a little bit more consciousness that it's open-ended towards the future so that you, you, know, you just don't know um, if it's gonna work or not. And then you, 
once people see it, they think it's something completely different than this thing you've been working on for the past year and a half. And they tell you what it is and you go, that's not what it is. That's not what I've been working on for a year and a half. It's something completely different. And that's important. That's, that's a, a valuable contribution that art makes to the development of futures and our ability to speculate. But that can be, um, uh, it doesn't have to be pleasant, <laughs> any of that. It can be very, very troubling uh, and um, kind of horrific, a good design and good art and good architecture. These are all wonderful. Gabriela, you want to say something? Just last comments, because we need to wrap up at yeah. some point. I, I was just uh, thinking that I missed the, the um, talking about my actors. So I just wanted to bring it back to um, to what Elizabeth's work and Ardell Lister are telling us about the future. And um, I just find that uh, as artists, they have, um, uh, uh, they're in a, in a very good position to imagine and speculate and be very critical. I mean, Art of Lister's Hell, if you haven't watched it, I recommend uh, watching it completely. It's, you know, it's uh, engaging with the same issues um, that we are thinking about technology and warning us about potential very, very bad futures, right? So the role the, the, the way that the artists think in comparison to the uh, actors in Ranjol um, work is completely different, right? The futures that artists are thinking about are more messy, are more critical. There's not a scientific objectism uh, um, thinking. There's not an idea of progress. It's a critical voice um, that is very necessary. And, and, and I do think that art uh, design and, and, and engineering have to work at different registers, but they have to work in simultaneously to be able to create uh, better futures. And the work of Elizabeth is actually pointing um, to our embodied relationship with technology, to the messy ways in which we're going to be creating subjectivities along uh, with technology in a way that it's kind of anticipating many of, of this uh, ways in which we're communicating right now and the ways of being. Um, so I, I think that artists have, without romanticizing the work of artists uh, uh, in, a, in a way that we don't want to romanticize the work of designers, uh, thinking, um, you know, uh, on a mountain telling us how we have to work and behave because they design a system and artists criticizing. I think that's what Elizabeth is doing is like creating a bridge between those two worlds and thinking how they're blurry. So, yeah. Just... Yeah. This is a great point, Gabriela. And it, I mean, as Moa says, it reminds me, I'll, I'll throw in a science fiction writer, Octavia Butler, and how she weaves in the past with the future as the only way to like actually really move forward. Uh, so thank you everybody uh, for this really wonderful uh, presentation out of my ballpark of expertise slightly, but uh, we managed. And just a request to Dora and Daniel, it would be great if you guys put like the bibliography that these three days of conversations have produced and share it with all of us. I would be very curious to see the books that appeared there, the articles, um, that would be lots of fun. Um, so Thodora, do you want to announce the, um, or Daniel, uh, the conversation between Elizabeth and Gabriela? Uh, Daniel, do you want to? I can, I can share the slide and, yeah. uh, and maybe we can talk about it um, for a second. So, well, no, thank you, Olga, for fantastic, uh, fantastically conducting this session and all the speakers. I'm going to share my screen to remind all of us about what we're doing. And I'd let Theodora introduce. Are you seeing it right now? Uh, we said day two. Oh. <laughs> Wonderful. So yes, this afternoon we have uh, Gabriela, uh, who is um, actually our collaborator in this larger project. Um, uh, you know, our Shark Grant and and all that. Uh, we have Gabriela um, in conversation with Elizabeth. Uh, van der Zag and uh, I think this morning was a wonderful teaser for all the um, exciting things that will be discussed. So we invite you all to return. Um, uh, so we will keep the 
we will keep the Zoom open, but today we have a slightly different. So yesterday and, and the day before, we we the audience could drop in at any minute, but today we actually have a a, a workshop with the authors um, of the papers in the symposium and who are also participating in a book project that Daniel and I are doing. So we would appreciate it if the audience could maybe uh, just join back a few minutes before the afternoon session, if that's okay. Um, so I don't know if you want to add anything, Daniel. No. But I just wanted to thank our panelists. That was that was um, fascinating. Uh, a lot of, uh, yeah, again, a lot of food for thought that now sounds like a platitude, but I mean it in the fullest. And uh, we will, we do have, uh, transcripts of the discussions and we're saving the chat and we will make sure to compile the resources in some way and, and circulate them to all the participants. Yeah, and for sure. So this afternoon session at three or four, uh, it's at three again? It's at three. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And just to, to, build on, to build on Taylor's point, the one way in which the bibliographies and discussions and conversations and papers will be assembled will be this book that we're also excited to, 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 to announce and, and introduce, you know, and I uh, are uh, working on it and we'll tell you a little more about it in the, um, in the, in the final session. So yeah, see you at 3 p.m. Thank you, Ranjal. Uh, thank you. Uh, I was just asking uh, because I'm on a different time zone. This the the workshop begins in one hour, right? Yeah. 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 Okay. And then the workshops for one and a half hour, and after that the conversation. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, okay. it will be relatively informal. So uh, I mean, the idea you can you can drop in and drop out yeah. whenever whenever you you want. Yeah. So. Okay. See you in a bit. Cheers. Great. Thank you, Ranjal. Okay, so we can stop the recording, I think, for now. And I think, we should, and Daniel, I think we should just also stop the live stream, right? Because we're not going to live stream the. Definitely, yeah. Um, is that something that Elif can do, or should should I do something here?
Good afternoon. Um, we are pleased to uh, start the final session for the Digital Visual Material Symposium. Uh, we were just chatting with Theodora a few minutes ago. What a joy this has been and uh, how excited we are about having this final session um, a, as a conversation between Liz van der Saag and Gabriela Acevedo Sepulveda. Um, we will um, do that. I will introduce Gabriela in a second. Um, um, and then after the conversation, we'll, we'll, we'll have a very brief kind of um, uh, wrap up. So it is my pleasure to, to welcome uh, Gabriela Sela Sepulveda as the moderator for this conversation with Liz van der Saag. Um, Gabriela was introduced in the previous session by uh, Olga Tulomi, um, but because some of the people who are joining the session now may not have been part of that session, I'm going to introduce you again, Gabriela. I hope that's okay. <laughs> um, well, Gabriela, Dr. Gabriela Acevedo Sepulveda is an assistant professor in the School of Interactive Arts and Technology at Simon Fraser University, where she directs the CIMAS, which is the Critical Media Arts Studio an interdisciplinary research and creation studio uh, whose work I invite everyone to take a look at. This combines many of the questions and, and, and um, uh, perspectives that we've been discussing take a, a very material presence in the work of, of, of that studio. Gabriela has degrees in design, media arts and cultural history and her work investigates the histories of art at the intersections of science and technology in the Americas. She's the author of Women Made Visible, Feminist Art and Media in Post-1968 Mexico, which was published by the University of Nebraska Press um, just a couple of years ago. Um, she's the author of several peer-reviewed articles, book chapters, and all research projects on feminist media art and archival practices in Latin America. All research interests include the connections between sound, race, and gender, the environmental entanglements of digital technologies, its histories and infrastructures, and the histories and theories of embodiment and performance. Her video and sculptural installation that explored the body as a site of cultural, gender, and biopolitical inscriptions have been exhibited in Canada, Mexico, France, India, Chile, and the US. I also want to say, say that Gabriela has been a close collaborator of Theodora and uh, and he, in this overall project, uh, the exhibition, the book, and the symposium, and it's uh, been a great joy to, to, to work with you, Gabriela. So welcome and thank you so much. Oh, thank you, um, Daniel, and thank you, Theodora, for, for inviting me. It's such an interesting conversation. Um, before I begin introducing Elizabeth van der Sack, I just want to again acknowledge that I'm connecting from the unceded uh, territories of the Coast Salish peoples, um, the Musqueam, the Squamish, and Zuelo two nations here um, um, in what is known as Vancouver, British Columbia. And so I, I'm really honored and it's my pleasure to introduce to you Elizabeth van der Sack. I'm, I'm going to read a little uh, of her bio, but I mean, her work is so extensive that I'm not gonna be able to cover everything that she's done. So um, she's been working in video and computer art since the 1970s. Her practice combines video, computer graphics and performance to construct an aesthetic language that describes women's lives through technology. She received a BA in English and film from the University of Western Ontario and briefly studied creative electronics at Fanshawe College in London, Ontario as well. Um, and computer arts at Simon Fraser University. She's been based in Vancouver since the late mid, mid 70s um, and has an extensive exhibition history internationally. She's founded and coordinated the Western Front Multimedia School from 1993 to 1999, where she trained um, other artists in the uses of uh, video technology. She has lectured and given many workshops across Canada and the United States since the 1980s. And her research on the visual sense of language to explore subjective and cultural sensibilities through interactive system 
is published in her book, Mother Tongue, a study of participant affect and interactive installation, which was published by Bear Lag in 2011. Um, so I would like to start, um, we, we discuss and we're gonna be a bit casual with this uh, presentation. So I, I think Elizabeth is gonna be showing us a lot of her work. And I was just gonna prompt her with some initial questions and we'll see how, how the conversation goes from there. Um, if at any point anyone wants to ask a question, I think it's okay rather than leaving questions at the end, unless, uh, unless uh, you think it's best the other way, but I think we can have it as a conversation. Uh, so I would like to start by asking you, Elizabeth, um, about the relationship um, between the content and the technique in your work, and more specifically on how you began to... Um, uh, to develop your own software, your own systems and your own work starting in the 1980s. Um, and I'm thinking, for example, of the custom software that you developed for the uh, Whispering Pines and interactive um, video. Um, well, uh, I, I don't know if I'm, if I'm on or not. I think I am. Um, what I did was um, I was working at the Western Front and the Western Front is actually where the, there was a fellow called Spencer Cafe and Kai Goodwin. They were actually the ones that were developing the software. So it wasn't me. I was just there cheering them along and uh, participating every step of the way without really offering anything in the realm of coding. So what we were doing was this was pre, before you could do uh, menu driven uh, computer things. You had to do everything with batch files in DOS. So what happened was, very much the, what you would do in order to create a sequence of images, you would just change one or two values because you had to do so many repetitive sentences that, so I think that kind of a programming environment made it so that we didn't do drastic changes. We just watched for very subtle, subtle changes over a sequence of like a hundred frames or something, just tiny little variations. And so, um, and of course you're always looking for why you would use these things, why you would try to use an emboss software or why, what would be the purpose of it? So I did a piece called Whispering Pines after having done a lot of time with these batch files, doing these interpreting, going between lines of things. So what I was looking at was aging and um, in a tree, for instance, the rings of a tree where the lines are, are about time, it's, it's age. And of course, with a woman, her skin also reflects those times. And in mathematics, lines are frequencies. So therefore I found this kind of commonality, this point of transformation between the tree and the human. So I created these embossed sequences and then that's the introduction to the first non-linear work I did in 1995, I think it was. So there I was experimenting with non-linearity as well. And um, the music is played by a wonderful musician called jo George Lewis. And it's a Johnny Horton song called Whispering Pines. So, um, which of course he found very amusing to play. Um, so I'm gonna share screen and show you just a little bit of Whispering Pines before I tell you anything more about it because it's, it's pretty straightforward. So, I don't know if I can talk over top of this. I think I can. Yeah. And so there's the, the woman and there's the log. This is a document from an exhibition, so there's background noise from the people that are in the exhibition. And the narrative is set up with a letter, with uh, what are they called? Those are called uh, hot, hot spots, and then you can link to different parts of the geography of this woman's life. So I'm going to go to stop share and uh, hope I did that right. So that's a, a, an example of 
um, custom software that was developed at the Western Front, but I didn't actually develop it because I don't have those skills, but I was the one that was using it all the time, trying to find ways to use it the way an artist would use it instead of just using it like for special effects or some artists were using uh, these software things to sort of imitate commercial art, but kind of turn it on its head. Kim and Lisa did some stuff like that where they subverted that kind of commercialized computer image and subverted it to make another kind of statement. So um, that would be the part with Whispering Pines that's um, the, where the software was involved. And of course, the, doing the non-linear narrative, initially, I think most of the games like Myst and those early games, they were really about geography, about going to different places and moving through walls and, and changing where you were going. So that was sort of one of the first metaphors for non-linear narratives that I can remember. So um, that's why Whispering Pines worked that way. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, I guess I'm being uh, very liberal with the, the work that you developed. I guess what I what I wanted to to to, to imply is that you were part of this group of people who were developing, testing, experimenting, and through your experimenting, um, that was um, you were working with this emboss filter, and you were thinking about aging and how um, the emboss filter uh, reflected. Um, yes. The life of, of a woman in, in her 40s thinking about aging because at the time you were thinking about aging and then you're thinking into the future. But then how does your work really um, influence or impact those conversations as, as, as those um, developers are developing software, right? It must have been, there must have been very interesting dialogues. Um, uh, perhaps you wanted to achieve something and then you pushed uh, uh, the two people like were trying to developing or were just applying and then there, there was a share of ideas. So I don't know if you can speak to that. Yeah, I would say that it was really exciting because um, it wasn't just me that was doing this work. And I think by always using the software, they kept tweaking it and changing it because I was always using it. And then people like Gary Pethick would come along and want to do a completely different type of project. And then we could use the software for that. We, there was a constant experimentation because the Western Front is really a center for all kinds of artists going in there. So yes, it was very collaborative and everybody had a different way of using it. Like it wasn't, you know, only this way. There was many different applications. Yeah, for sure. Excellent. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to uh, ask a question. If not, I'll move on with, a, with another, um, another opening for another work. Um, so, uh, then let's turn now to how your work deals with the question of materiality, which we already started thinking about it through, through a question of aging. Um, but, um, and I, here I want to understand like, materiality uh, also in, in a very expanded way, um, both as your, um, your life, how your life seeps into your work, and also the access to the technology that you had at, at that particular time. Um, and, and how, how you translate those lived experiences into your work to think about how the digital could mediate them or how the computer could mediate such, such relationships. So, and I'm thinking here, for example, of your other works um, that had to do with voice, with the female voice uh, and particularly talking back and talk nice for, for which you also participated uh, in the development of a custom software, um, right? So maybe yeah. you can look at those things. Or I don't know if you want to continue talking no, it, more about Whispering Science. Sort of, they sort of continue along the work. Continue. This was at, still at Western Front Multimedia training. We were doing these kinds mm -hmm. of things. We had access to, the government was paying us to buy equipment for technology. So we had all access to things. Plus we had all these really interesting people that could, would come from industry and from the arts to sort of give workshops and show us how to do different things. And remember the 90s, we didn't think the internet was going to be as big as it was. We thought it was just going to be interactivity that was the key thing. Mm -hmm. So the internet sort of came along, uh, slipped up on us, sort of, so to speak. And so, um, do you remember when there was a, a thing called dragon speech, where you were doing text to speech, and you'd always have to, or speech to text, and you'd have to speak in a certain way, like a very monotonal way, so that the computer could understand you. Well. That apparently causes carpal tunnel syndrome of the throat, believe it or not, because our voices are used to going in very large dynamic ranges. They're built for that. So um, I felt that we were doing the wrong thing. We were thinking about 
um, the computer as a prosthetic device, kind of like an extension of like su a substituting for part of ourselves or something like that. And I thought, let's look at the computer as a way of a filter, like a, a way to look really at more detail that's in our, that's in our humanity, in our voice or in our different functions of our bodies. So I looked at the, uh, the tone of voice, the prosody of voice. And part of it, of course, is that ongoing narrative of being a mother and being in your life. So I did one on about yelling at your kid, um, becoming aware of the tone of your voice when you're interacting with your child. And so I did one, um, this was a really simple project. It wasn't simple actually, because we had to get a X object, a, a, sound, um, a sound analysis tool into what was then the program that we used to create interactive projects called Director. So it was an X object that went into Director, but primarily the main thing that it was um, looking at was amplitude. So that's pretty easy to pull out of a speech signal. So we did amplitude of five different segments and under each one of those levels of amplitude, there was about 10 or so different responses by the user. So these are video clips that are then pulled up by the director program when the user has a voice that is within those parameters of volume. And um, so I used it to get a kid to do the dishes, which is always a challenge. So. And it was really interesting, the loop between the interactive experience using the computer to help you look at yourself. That was a really interesting way to experience interactivity as a way to put a lens on ourselves instead of creating an external prosthetic and an external device of externalizing ourselves. So I'll play just a little tiny little bit of this because it's very annoying, this piece. I have to tell you, I have to warn you. <laughs> These kids can be really annoying. But um, they did a good job for me, I have to say. I'll just pause it right. Oh, no, that's okay. This just says that it's a CD ROM that listens to your voice. Hello? Do the dishes right now. Uh, I can't hear you. Do the dishes right now. We just pick up. Do the dishes right now. No way. Do them yourself. Do the dishes. Please, can I do it later? Do the dishes right now, Britta. I don't feel like it. Do the dishes. You're so unfair. I hate you. Do the dishes. I'm not your servant, you know. Time to do the dishes. Can I try to do it tomorrow? Do the dishes. Why can't you ask normally? Please do the dishes. You're ignoring me. Do the dishes. No way. Do them yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to help, but I got a lot of homework. Too Sorry, what did you say? Please do the dishes. You're always picking on me. <laughs> no, you're sure, I'll me. do them. I like helping. So um, that piece played um, in a few places and literally people could not believe how present that girl seemed to be because of the, so it shows you, you a few little video skills help you to create an interactive experience that seems a little bit more convincing perhaps than if it had just been a little meter going up and down. Um, and I think one of the things that we've, I've discovered with um, the flow that happens when you're in, in an interactive situation is that the reflective ability of the system that you've designed to feed back into your reality is something that we don't really consider that much, but I think it's an important part of this, what I discovered from this work, which I didn't necessarily start out doing. You never start out doing the things that it ends up being. But with art, it's not, when you're making these projects, you're just trying to make them work, get it to go and have it happen. And um, I think that's one of the things that was really interesting because of course, at the same time as this is going on, we're suddenly seeing a, a kind of a resurgence of people analyzing behavioral things and things like that. So all of a sudden we have this embedded tool within our systems that could help us do that. And whether or not that is something that we want to have happen or not, is suddenly it's fairly powerful, these tools that help people manipulate what the affect of a user is and to know what the affect is. So at the same time as it's really exciting to have this feeding back about your presence about what your state of mind is through different signals that you're not even aware of. We are also at a place where we could be severely manipulated by having that awareness be out there for other systems to analyze. And then that put me into another project 
around um, sound and socialization of young women, young girls, um, with a project called Talk Nice. And that one was more involved. It was a very complex piece of software, but I got it through a project, uh, was able to develop it so robustly because Sarah Diamond had a fabulous project at the Banff Center for the Arts that I was successful in gaining uh, access to. And so I was able to spend like a lot of time on this project and it's called Talk Nice. And in this program, facilitated also by some of the software people at the Banff Center for the Arts and also by programmers that I brought from Vancouver to do this programming, they, I was able to take the voice analysis another level. And at this point, we're de dealing with the uh, detection of end of phrase and then backing up just a fraction uh, to see if there's a change in pitch going up. So it's fairly complicated, but uh, the, as soon as we got the end of phrase one down, then it wasn't too hard for it to quickly backtrack to see whether or not it was going up, the pitch was going up. So that not only pitch detection, but end of phrase. So that was done. And then of course I had lots of time to create the video clips and the, it was a bit more robust. So this is a fairly longer piece with an introduction and then a, a part where you're interacting and at the end of it, you get to go to a party. And um, this piece was shown in a, quite a few different countries in the world because of course the Banff Center has such a big reach and everybody wants to see the work that's produced at the Banff Center. It's not because of me, that's for sure. But um, what I found out was I showed it in a place uh, in South Korea and a lot of the girls there were really interested in it but they weren't really interacting with it in a robust way. They're very self-conscious and then it turned out when I talked to their teacher or somebody else there that said that they have their own little types of speaking patterns that are all their own. That's their own time of their lives that they create these own tonal patterns. Then I played it also, another place where it played was in Sao Paulo. Well, there was a much more robust reaction to it there. There was, the kids were so proud of themselves. They would just, they would come in every single day pretty well after school and play with this piece because at the end of it, you get to dance to some music and then they were at the party. Um, and these kids were much more willing to interact with it and to be really positive about who they were and just like answer those questions right away. Once they figured out the game, there was a little ball like going above the line. So there's different ways that this piece has been perceived in different countries. I was really, really interested in that as well. So then I realized that language and culture has a lot to do with our speech thing. And which is probably what brought me to the next piece, which is mother tongue. But I will talk to, I'll just show you a little bit about Talk Nice if you're interested. Um, it's just a demonstration from again, an exhibition. And I have to apologize for the quality because I don't know why I can't document installations, but they're hard, yes. Okay, I'm gonna show it just a little bit, just a minute. Oh, hi, it looks like someone sat down in the chair. The point of this game is to get you to talk nice by talking up. Just sit in the chair and speak into the microphone. Yeah, my name's Megan. What's your name? Helen. Watch the ball at the side of the screen, and whenever you speak up, the ball will go up. Try to get the ball past the green line on the screen. Hello. Whoa, this person's got it going on. Try saying, I'm a Canadian, eh? I'm Canadian, eh? Wow, you've got it. Killer, you totally have potential. Let's practice. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, say anything. I like cookies. <laughs> that was like a totally awesome job. <laughs> wow, you did great. Now you get to go on to some new scenes. Maybe we'll see you later. There's going to be a really cool party at Josh's house on Friday night. Do you want to go? No. That's great. We can totally hear you. What would you do if you went to a party and you had like the totally wrong outfit? I would say who cares? Have you ever gone to a party where you're like just so tired and you don't want to be there? No. no. Hey, can we get a ride with you to the party? See? You answered five questions with an up. No. My God, you are so nice. You seem definitely some caring of us. Can I do your hair? Can I do your hair? 
Let's do some coloring. Castellan. Yeah, let's do some coloring. Castellan. So that's uh, talk nice. The last part was the kids in Sao Paulo that came every day to play that piece. Um, so in the, the show that it was in in Sao Paulo was called Emotion Artificial. And it was about the uh, role of affect or the place of affect in computer interaction. And of course that had to be brought out. It had to be like, whoa, let's, let's talk about emotion in computer interaction. For some reason that hadn't been part of the dialogue, the affect or whatever that kind of emotional humanitarian kind of component of it constantly has to be emphasized and pulled out in our design of how we create our computer interactions. And I think that's one of the things that's really um, difficult even now because I think our, our, we're limiting ourselves all the time, continuously. Every time we come up with a new technology, we limit ourselves. Look at emoticons. Emoticons are like this. When we look back at emoticons in the future, we'll say, boy, those poor people, they couldn't even express happiness or anything. They had to do a smiley face. Um, I just feel like our bandwidth of affect has really been um, narrowed down through our technology. And of course that's helped us because we've been able to interact right now, for instance, in a co non-geographic uh, coexistence. But at the same time, I think we're missing a lot of the gestures and a lot of the uh, affect that we could have if we were in the same room with each other. Um, and then I think one of the things that this one led to for me was this idea about uh, the embodiment of language, which is that it's performed physically by your body and that your body and your emotions are linked. And that people like Antonio Damasio, neuroscientists have really established those connections, but we've never really looked at it in terms of the production of language. And um, there are many theories around the language embodiment, but I think one of the things that I took away from further research into this area was that sound, once you start making the, looking at the materiality of sound, you can really start to look at the different ways that sounds are made. And for instance, I took apart um, the Frisian language, which is my grandmother's, my mother's language and my grandmother's language. So it would be my mother tongue, but I don't even know how to speak it. But I did a whole bunch of analysis of it in a speech lab, and I noticed that the vowels together, by looking at the picture of it, only by externalizing it into a picture, into a spectrograph, could I see that these vowels were really uh, very much the same. They were uh, they used more variations between like they would do three vowels in a row or four vowels in a row, whereas our languages tend to have a consonant vowel, consonant vowel, or two vowels or something like that. So I talked about a lot of different things in this piece. And I talked to many people with many different languages and we did spectrographic displays of it. And people were able to perform different languages by trying to copy the spectrographic display of the sound of the, of the, the samples of, of different languages. And people did experience that they had, first of all, they had the flow, what they call the flow, Lazaro calls the flow in the game gaming uh, environment. But at the same time, they also said they had different uh, feeling a different, affect during the experience of these different languages. And I just wanted to play one tiny little clip of Sally Lee talking about what speaking your mother tongue and speaking English uh, experienced for her. So this was just a little piece that I thought would be fun to show. And uh, this is in an exhibition at, uh, I think it was at EBC, I'm not sure. And um, there was, these are two monitors side by side. Even though it's something that I use on a daily basis now, English is, I think, with English, talk with English. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's quite secondhand feeling still. It's, it's way more logical when I'm speaking in another language other than my, my mother's tongue, my mother tongue. But uh, at the same time, when I'm expressing something, um, when I'm talking in Cantonese, Sometimes it can be too overwhelming for me that I find that it will be easier to use another language to express something that might be too personal that I don't know how to go deeper in it. Um, I think for many people that may be true. Um, and I just like the way she said that, but I also wanted you to experience the spectrograph and how her words become so material. So that I think is really a shift towards and materiality that is something that 
we can do by parsing out the realities that are around us all the time. And so being able to parse those out, tease out those things that are kind of invisible, we have a greater understanding and greater sympathizing with what we are in our world, how we exist here. So I, I really do like that part about the digital and the material, that the digital can tease out material that we don't necessarily see or hear, but with the digital manifestation of it by recalculating what that is or syntactically repurposing it into something that we can act, uh, acknowledge through our other senses, I think we are getting a wider awareness of ourselves. And I enjoyed that piece for doing that. Um, so I think that was all I had to say about that. Um, I think it's sort of, I really actually really like that kind of idea about the ephemeral things that are around us that we don't know, but then certain artists can pull those out. There's other artists that do these things too that I just, uh, those are the pieces that really speak to me when they take a piece of imagery that's something that's out there. For instance, information that's going through our, the air right now on our internet, for instance. You know, some people have, artists have visualized that in different ways and it's just so interesting to see that. So that's sort of a material transformational idea with this digital material idea that I like. I think that's kind of fun, yeah. Well, thanks for sharing that, uh, Elizabeth. Um, I, I want to ask you more about sound, but uh, I, I just find fascinating how you're thinking about how, um, how to think about affect and emotions and how in your work, sound has played a, a very important role since the beginning. Yes. And, and, and I'm, I'm really interested in that dialogue between the visual uh, and, the, and, and the audio and the auditory. Um, but it also made me think about um, an early conversation we had a couple of days ago when you were talking about initially what drove you to um, work with computers and, and start experimenting and playing with Grax and, and with the video signal is that you actually could create things that did not exist yes. with, with the electronic signal. Um, yeah. So I just find this, um, this interest in, in the dialogue between what you can see and what you cannot see and how both audio and visual are integral to making things visible or to make us things. Um, yes. it's, it's really interesting. Um, and so I know that you've been working in new projects that have to, to do with sound and, and the translation to sound into material. So I would like um, to prompt you to talk about those things um, and maybe also open it up a little bit to see if somebody has any questions, but. Um, okay, well, one of the things that happens, I don't know how many people here are digital artists uh, because it is one of the most frustrating uh, mediums to work in. Um, the work that I've done that will be shown in the gallery uh, with uh, in this fall with the Upam, I think it's at Upam with Theodora and Danielle, um, is video. And the video that I made because of I have great nonprofit societies that work with me and distributors that have actually done things like move it over to beta cam, back it up, move it over and archive and archive and archive. Every 10 years, those media have to be updated and then archived again. However, both talking back no, Whispering Pines, first of all. Honestly, I got it sitting here on a mini Mac and somebody says, well, you need to have a USB mouse and a USB keyboard and a, some sort of a DV monitor. Well, how? I don't have those things. So I've got Whispering Pines sitting on a mini Mac, but don't have a way to put it out. I will, I could do it if I need to do it. And that's been because it showed at a gallery in 2014 and the person there managed to get it off of the CD-ROM it was on and put it through emulator software for gaming and put it on an operating system that no longer exists. So the whole problem with digital art is that the operating systems, the archiving systems, the connectors, everything goes away and you have, you lose it, it's gone. So talking back and talk nice, both of those pieces just exist in that tiny little document that you see. So the things that frustrates me is that materiality of the actual artwork. So that was one of the first thoughts I had about when Danielle and Theodora uh, invited me to be participants here was that the materiality of the digital artwork is such a problem. And that's something that's not really a problem because it's really turning into that when I, later on, I'd like to talk a little bit about NFTs and how artwork is existing completely in the digital realm. But one of the things I did as a result of that was, and also because I really liked the idea of doing this was to do a, a project with the Chicard Loom. And there, there was an access, a, a textile art society in Vancouver that has and I would have access to workshops and things and how to use it. So I started to do, and I'm gonna just sh uh, share some pictures of this going on. So it's not a big deal. Um, this, 
I just was going to talk a little bit about the material of, of weaving. Yeah. That it's a manifestation of the digital, but that's still a material signal, the spectrograph. So these are sound signals. This is just the test. It is not an either or, it's just a progression in the materiality. The complexity of the digital signal as source provides a great texture, image rhythms, and content. And this is a jacquard loom, which has a computer running the, so it's just a spectrographic image that I've processed through Pratt as software. And then it's on the little computer, which is on the left of there. And then it tells the little threads, which ones have to come down. So all I have to do is the shuttle, the bar and the shuttle that I'm holding in my left hand there. Um, so, and then um, this is a way to sort of preserve your digital moment. And I find this to be really interesting. And I really love the low res factor of this. Like as the signal is coming through, it takes quite a while. Each line takes a little while to do. So um, it takes, uh, so it's, I, I like the way that it turns into a tangible, the digital into, a, this is the most tangible work I've ever made. And there's Ruth dyeing the, the thread so that we can have the blue instead of black, because this is a black and white, generally black and white loom. Um, so uh, that's how, that's what I've been working with there. But then with COVID now, I don't go to this place anymore because it's a little bit too, um, this is what I've been working with, uh, bird songs. This is an eagle. And then this is uh, the, the spectrograph when I've reduced it to 10 points and then you have to put it in Photoshop and attach weave patterns to it. And then after you've done your weave patterns, these are when, what it is like before I do the weave patterns. I think I put too much dark in that one. And then, um, I, I weave it up and this is the eagle sound, which is uh, the little jiggly part in the back there. That's the chainsaw that you see here in the back. So <laughs> there's always sounds in these bird song samples. Um, I've also got one here of an owl, which is coming up in a second here. And these are pieces that are done. They don't take me too long to do, but I'm not good at it yet. So I don't think they're, this is the actual spectrum. <laughs> So you hear that ooh, there at the end. And then you, the crickets are at the top there, those crickets that you hear. And um, then you have your, uh, you process it again through the reducing it. So it's so different than what most high res, the high res initiatives that are being done in technology now. This is low res, this is so low res that it's unbelievable. But in, it doesn't photograph well. I have to say, uh, because it's material, it doesn't translate photographically back into the digital screen very well, in my opinion. So um, that's the project I've been working on for the last little while. And um, I also really like the fact that it comes out of the Chicard Loom. The Chicard Loom is really the very first iteration of the punch card. And what was it used for? For making fabric, for doing weaving, to supplant a labor, but also to create a repetition, to create repetitive patterns. That's why you have the jacquard pattern, which is this kind of repetitive pattern. And so I'm really still looking for the actual link between the con concept of the jacquard loom and to create a piece that would reflect that. Right now I'm taking a content from somewhere else, which is bird song and concern about environment and applying that to this and sticking it on top of that. I'm trying really hard to find out what is the actual, what would be the lovely synthesis between the concept of the jacquard loom and the weaving that would do it. And I'm really looking forward to seeing Jared Thorpe's weaving in uh, the exhibition you're having this fall, because that he, the, he said he was using data sets to generate the imagery. So I'm really looking forward to seeing that. And also I was really interested in Jemana Boskowski's work in Concordia with the tactile fabric. So um, I think there's an awful lot of, I think digital artists are, I, I, I wasn't gonna put this into the talk, but then after I saw that, I went, I think there's a meme here. I think we're starting to go back to more organic materials and ways to work with technology because we don't necessarily want to work always with this high res environment. So sort of a feeling about that. Yeah. Very interesting to, to think about um, in retrospect of your work, the interest in on the in materiality oh, I'm sorry, I missed you. Oh, sorry. I can't hear Just you. Fascinating sorry. to think about. Can you hear me now? Um, to think of your work, how it started by an interest to, to make images with the electronic signal that was kind of up in the air. And now going back all the way 
to actually making things that are real material and thinking about the issues that we have with archiving and preserving digital art and how the actual the actual thing that actually stays with us the longer is you know when thinking about archive is the paper rather than uh, the digital yeah. file um yes um fa yeah. fascinating um anyway um I don't know if there's anyone in the audience that wants to make a comment on the on the recent pieces on on textiles and and the jacquard and the um, translation uh, between the audio and the textile. Um, if not, um, we had we had uh, oh, there's a question over there from uh, Kaylin. Um, I don't know if you can see it in the chat, Elizabeth, or do you want me to read it for uh -huh. you? Oh, um, oh, she says, I have a broad question for you. You have referred to the game mist and the term flow as it is used in game design. I wonder if you could speak more about how games influence your work. Um, um, I, I like the, I found that the only way to describe interactive experiences in, from an academic point of view was by going back to game theory. I think the people that are talking about flow in terms of when people get involved with playing with games actually have a better understanding of what's actually going on with that. It, it spoke more to me and one of those people was Lazaro and she was actually employed in the gaming industry to talk about flow. And MIST was just, when we were doing the Western Front Multimedia training, we were getting uh, the early, this was this was in the 1990s. So of course we had really early pieces. And this was one of the really important games for our students to look at because it had this sort of uh, navigational uh, branching that was quite sophisticated at the time. Yeah. So other, other than that, I haven't done too much computer gaming. I'd like to, I'd love to find a new game to play. Right now, I think it's called gambling or you know those kind of things that people do online with numbers. <laughs> Great. Um, so I know that you have been doing a lot of uh, research on NFTs and bitcoins and blockchains, and I'm wondering if you if you wanted to um, share your thoughts with us about that. I mean, we we did we did talk about. Um, uh, the possible futures that 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 art and artists can 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 show us, and so um, on one way you're going back to the material of the textile when computers just began, um, yes. with the, the jacquard, and on the other side you're you're thinking about NFTs and and blockchain. So I don't know, I want to share some thoughts? Um, I think I think technology is always inventing itself, and I think that's why it's so interesting. I, I think the the people that are in the world right now thinking about technology, of course, uh, there's, they're, they're just, it's always so interesting. And I always like to be involved in something when it's coming about. Um, uh, I think no one had any idea in the seventies that digital technology would be what it is. Okay, people, when I was doing the digital stuff in the seventies, people were like, huh? you know, why would you do that? I worked at CDC, I was the first digital video operator because nobody wanted to do it because it was just crunching up stuff and pulling stuff out of addresses. Um, so it wasn't analog enough. So I think the next stage that we're seeing here with the blockchain is really going to change the way we have, uh, it's like they call it web 3.0 or whatever it's called. I think it's going to change the way it's done. And I've read some places that countries like places like Africa are going to adopt blockchain before they get to all the other types of systems. And I think in terms of materiality, Honestly, what a change we are seeing right now um, in terms of materiality. So I just have a few little notes, if you don't mind. I'm just going to spend a few minutes just reading some stuff, if that's okay. So I'm saying here, we are limited by our senses as to what we perceive to be material. So there's lots of layers of material that we can't perceive. So the energy and tangible math has to be made into something for us to perceive. However, now we're getting this whole other kind of tangible math, which has a value associated to it which is called cryptocurrency. And um, another question is whether the online world of value and the analog world of fiat will remain distinct realms. That hasn't been true of the internet broadly. The distinction between meat space and cyberspace has broken down very nearly completely, except in extreme cases, online life is just life. 
That said, most people spend most of their time on platforms like YouTube, Facebook, newspapers, Zoom, and that present a unified structure atop of the chaos of the World Wide Web. And I really find the interesting thing about the fact that now we've almost gone away completely from any kind of physical uh, fiat. And um, we are also now starting to bring into, we're seeing a, an emergence of these non-fungible tokens, which is kind of revolutionizing the art world a little bit because it's it reflects the financialization of art, which is really what's been going on in the last while, at least since the 70s and 80s. Um, and so it's really just saying, oh yes, it's just about money. And, but they're not actually things. That's what's so amazing about it. I don't really understand the medium yet. I'm really working on it and I'm every day researching and there's tons of material out there. So it's wonderful that way. Um, and I just wanted to bring uh, an artist to your attention who I think is fabulous. Her name is Sarah Mayas and she's only 30 years old. And she's got a, a project called Bitchcoin which she started in 2014. Now remember, Bitcoin only was invented in 2010 or something. And so she was like before Ethereum, which is the second biggest crypto out there. So she was early, early stages. And she had a, a, there was a friend of hers who had a gallery in Brooklyn, which was just a shipping container. She painted it bright pink and then she filled it up with computers and generated her own Bitcoin, which I think is just the agency of that for a young woman, I just love it. And um, she's just, um, got, right now she's in an auction with these bitch coins, they're on an auction because this is called making money with art. And uh, she did a piece called, in 2017, called Cloud of Petals. And so in that piece she had, um, basically it was a project with at Bell Labs that she took over and they photographed 100,000 rose petals. And then she has 3,000 petals approximately in storage in a vault someplace that where each person had to pick out one petal from each flower. So the Bitcoin that you're going to buy an auction right now, which is for the next three days, Bitcoins will buy or will be reflecting a token for one of those actual real material rose petals, which are in storage. And you don't actually get them. All it is is uniquely establishing the symbiotic value of token and backing. So the backing part is the part that is material at this point. How much longer will it be material? How much longer will we have um, NFTs, um, cryptocurrency, anything that has a relationship with anything material? And at this point in time, I think that's gonna be in another 10 years, we will not have a material reference to the things that we consider to be an asset or a intrinsic value. And I think that's really a shift from the kind of weavings and the kind of projects that we've done. Of course, I don't know anything about this at this point in time. I'm just learning, but I'm telling you, I think it's really becoming something with a great deal of, of um, confusion with what is really there and what is mathematics. And I think we see this complete rise of, the, this has got to be the most mathematical thing there is. And of course it takes a great deal of energy so one of the most weirdest NFT projects would be um, an NFT project that said, oh, it's so bad to have climate change. We've got to do something about energy usage and then put it as an NFT. So that would be an oxymoron. <laughs> so I think these are issues that are being resolved. Um, and I think we've become very aware of our energy usage. And I think these things are bringing it to a light, but I don't think we're gonna go back. I don't think we're gonna go back to um, um, fiat currency. Or, and I think art is gonna to change to be tokens that point at something, maybe an experience, maybe a performance. Uh, it won't necessarily be an artifact. Mm, interesting. I'm just thinking, I mean, and I don't know where I'm gonna fit into this space. I haven't even figured that out. Yeah. yeah, it's 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 a very interesting space and very rapidly moving. And so rapidly that it's hard to keep up with what's happening. Um, but it also made me think about um, this kind of um, really utopic or I expectation or, or 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 idea that we have that technology is not material. And then we you brought it up at the end, and I know that there are several people in the audience thinking about how actually the digital is really linked to the material. And it has always been, I mean, our capitalist economy is built on abstractions that have that have a 
a, a currency that have the earth that we need to, you know, we're extracting resources from the earth to be able to have those abstractions. So yes, I am wondering if, if um, when, you know, cryptocurrency and NFTs and all these things that are um, making that visible, uh, um, we just kind of unplug them and, you know, we cut out the servers and they don't, they don't exist anymore. And so we have to go back to our experience, our, you know, embodied experiences. Yes. So, yeah, um, yeah. I, I see a recurrence, like a, 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 a wanting us to think that, that, that the digital is completely abstract, that it's creating different things, that there's no uh, a material backing, but there's always a material backing. It's just always being obscured from us. Yes, <laughs> except if you heat your house with all the computers that are churning out the numbers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's mating. Yeah, um, yeah I, don't, I don't know if anyone wants to uh, comment or um, uh, ask something about Elizabeth's work at, um, at this point. No? Yeah, I'd be very interested to see if there's more artists working in this space. I would really like to find out more about it. I'll, I'll do more research on that area. I think it's really uh, something new. So far, it's turning everybody into artists by the sounds of things. <laughs> yeah. A quick uh, question, Liz. First of all, thank you so much. It was so wonderful to hear you talk about your work. Um, I, I was curious, to, and forgive me if I don't capture the, the what I'm trying to capture from, from your words, but at a point in your presentation, you talked about the digital uh, having this kind of interesting potential for you, which has to do with extending or, or, or tracing part of our kind of lives or, or interactions and so on. And, um, and, that that, and that that is something that, that in that process we can learn something about ourselves. And I found that, that very compelling and very powerful uh, and seems to encapsulate part of the power of, of, your, of your art. My question has to do with the, the changing conditions of, of technological interactions today, right? The, the, these wonderful pieces where, where you use sound processing or image processing to create, to stage these interactive moments that are so incredibly full of life and, and unexpected and, 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 and beautiful and those videos capture them so well. My question is, do you, do you see new potentials emerging for that kind of interaction or artistic sort of in, in an artistic context? connected to things like facial recognition or um, uh, machine learning algorithms, this kind of more data intensive things. Is that something that interests you at all? Or how is, how are you still thinking along those lines? I think that's a, that's a, that's a, a really good point because I think my reaction to that is now, like this was in 2000 that I was looking in these things. But now I actually feel that if I even make a little facial change my face in some way, the computer will see it and they'll feed me some advertising. So I've become actually very nervous about that openness I had to it in the 1990s and 2000. I was so open to that loop about the computer giving us information about ourselves so that we could expand our understanding of our relationships and our interactions with other people and aspects of our being. Now I find that the danger of it is to be commercialized so quickly that I find that the next period of time will be one of hiding more. I'm afraid that that may be just me being a pessimist, but um, remember when we started the internet, it was that same idea of decentralized thing that the blockchain is now trying to uh, sort of as an example of. And when the internet started, it was as a sort of response to uh, mainstream media which with a central voice. So suddenly we were gonna have all these different voices and it was really like that for a while. I mean, it did start with DARPA too, but never mind that part. <laughs> you know, I'm just saying that I think my feeling right now is that anytime you're gonna come up with a technology that can parse this, parse a little bit about yourself, it is gonna be picked up so quickly by a technology company that wants to exploit that. That's why I'm kind of concerned about that. I don't know what is your feeling about that. I think I'm with you. I I, I find it. Um, I grapple with with how to engage creatively with technologies that so often seem to play that role that you mentioned, a role in, yeah, like 
supporting surveillance or advertisement infrastructures that that are yeah. kind of more more of a governing kind of structure than than a liberating structure. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, that. So unfortunately, I'm not thinking well, but maybe I will again in a hiding kind of a way. <laughs> it's a good question, though. It's really happening. Interesting, but, but maybe your turn to match reality to the textile is away from hiding. Yes. Um, <laughs> yes. Or a way of returning. Um, oh, there's an interesting uh, relationship there, but uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, think, um, I think other people are, I, I, we, that's why I'm really curious to see what artists are doing in the, in the digital realm right now, because it is always, there is always commentary as well, you know, about what's going on and then the surveillance and that sort of thing is becoming so ubiquitous that I don't know. I, I think they, um, the the blockchain is going to become a hiding place. I think that's what that's about. Maybe, maybe that's what it's about. Yeah, I'll look into that. Well, lots of uh, things to think about. Um, um, I don't know if anyone has a. I don't know how we're doing on time. I lost track of the program. I think we have like five more minutes. Um, and I'm wondering if there are any other questions from the audience to Elizabeth's work. Um, oh yeah, and just Daniel just put on the, the environmental cost of NFTs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I had a quick question, maybe, but but we can always extend the conversation a little bit. I mean, we do that. I mean, I know everyone is probably quite tired on a, on a Friday <laughs> afternoon, but I think there's so much to talk about. So we don't have to feel that we need to wrap it up kind of prematurely okay. if, if there's more questions from the audience. Uh, I mean, yeah, Liz, thank you so much. And it's so incredibly thought provoking. I think there's so many kind of different topics to pick on. I had one particular curiosity about children and and kind of seeing the videos of the children kind of interacting with your work. And there's always this kind of like sense of wonder, of play. Um, and I mean, again, as a, as a mother of young children, I keep thinking, um, is there space for that kind of interaction today in a world that's so kind of like immersed with digital media? I mean, I see kind of my daughter being completely unsurprised when a thing kind of talks back to her on her phone, on, on my phone, actually, not her phone yet, thankfully. Um, uh, I'm just kind of like wondering about precisely the kind of ubiquity of digital technologies and whether the kinds of experiences which I might be kind of projecting on the world, but I, think as, I see also as quite kind of playful and provocative and creating that sense of wonder. What would it take to recreate some of that today? Um, I don't know, maybe with children or with just people in general, like the changing kind of ideas about, about interaction um, in our kind of, you know, saturated environment. I think, I think we've become narrower. I think because of uh, the tiny little telephone, you know, you go anywhere and all the young people are sitting there like this on their little tiny telephone. So I think our little tiny little viewpoints have really, they've zoomed very tight right now. And um, I think kids are just dying to like explode out of their bodies and more dimensionality. So if, um, I don't know why the gestural uh, interfaces haven't taken off. Remember in HCI back in the nineties that gestural stuff was so big you know, the we remember that game, that's all physical, but the physical interaction hasn't taken off. So if the physical interaction comes back, kids are gonna go crazy, they're gonna love it. I think, and, you know, and now we've been in these rooms with these screens all the time. I think it's, I think we're looking at some effects, especially for the young people, to see them constantly, they're going to school like this, they're, they're always in this screen world and then they go to their little tiny little screen I think that we're going to see a little explosion at some point, at least I hope so, <laughs> because they need to get loose. They can need to let it out there a bit. Maybe something will come along that will let them do that in an interactive way, since everything has to be mediated with a digital interface now. I'm hoping that that will happen. What do you think with your kids? Like, do they watch, do they like your phone a lot? Uh, I think they consider it just something that's out there. I don't think there's this kind of, Exciting. I mean, I remember as a kid when I first kind of had the experience of interacting with a, a digital thing, it was like a whole other world. But I think now it's become more mundane, but also um, 
kind of strangely pervasive and maybe dangerously so I'm not sure mm -hmm. uh, but yeah I was wondering also on on just not only on everyday kind of interactions but when it comes to to art and art making and to kind of creating some of the experiences that we saw in 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 your videos which you know there was a kind of suspension of disbelief there was a kind of surprise there was wonder like people wanted to return to the piece it was very playful and I'm just kind of wondering if that was an artifact of that particular time or if you think that that can be recreated now I think that picks up a little bit on Daniel's question as well um you know given the kind of changes in technology how what's the changing nature of those interactions as well when it comes also to kind of interactive art and uh, things like that I, I i i agree with you i think that that was a 20 years ago two decades ago it's a different time now and i think it would be a little bit naive now it would be a little bit unsophisticated um and also the teenage girls would be really irritated to have to be reminded of their talk because they get much more protective of it then th those kids are really having fun with it right so i don't know if they can make well i think we just have to make more projects to see what what the society is like now but i wouldn't make a piece like this now the resources alone would be <laughs> insurmountable plus of course these things just die out they just disappear so it's a very uh challenging to make work in the digital realm that constantly disappears, unless you have a great deal of uh, documentation and great deal of, you know, kind of manifestation, material archives of it. <laughs> yeah. And it just makes me think how, um, how that wonder uh, that is ex expressed in those pieces and, and, and your wonder in, in trying to explore uh, interactivity through technology it's turning right now in a more pessimistic tone. I mean, particularly in the work that's coming out from artists who are actually critiquing uh, face recognition software. Um, I'm thinking of the work of Kate Crawford and, um, um, and other, other artists there, um, even students at, uh, at our school who are like really thinking of AI harm, um, particularly how, um, you know, the photos that, that we, we shared in, um, in, um, and um, I'm trying to think of this um, software. It's not Google Photos, but the previous one, I, I remember the, I think it's Flickr, how those photos were, were used uh, to train algorithms, um, facial recognition al algorithms, when one shared those photos in, in this spirit of sharing and democratizing access of open source ideas and, and creative commons. And then those photos that you put up there you then realize they're, they're being used to train algorithms for facial recognition software by governments that may not be, um, um, you know, very um, uh, social conscious in the ways they're using those facial recognition software. So I think that there's a, there's a more sobering discourse coming out from artists that is more critical um, in comparison to the 90s when it was more about you know, exploring playfulness, so. Yeah. Yeah, I, I also think that the um, uh, the narratives change. Like I think the uh, a lot of the time when we we first had interactive media, we we were like really experimenting with what narrative could be, and um, I don't think people are quite so interested in exploring that anymore either. What do you think? We're pretty happy with just going click click and do that and do that because we're just. It's a functional thing now of our lives. We're no longer going. If somebody had, to, if I had to go to um, to to read the news and I had to go down this big channel of of things to to click on before I could get to the information I want, I would. I want the most direct link. It's probably what's going to happen. What Leslie was talking about yesterday was that it'll go right into our brain. <laughs> I wonder if Leslie wants to say something. Yes. So. Uh, uh... I'm an optimist who's having a hard time. And uh, I, I noticed that in you also, Gabriella. So uh, 50 years ago, I wrote about how, the, how we, we should make all major institutions, especially public institutions like universities, democratize access to technology like computers, especially to artists. And uh, I hear that's not... Uh, uh, really happening. 
and and then and then we were we were talking about uh, and then it was big how to bring the two cultures of sleep, CP snow together, and I made a little note uh, earlier about it. Seems to be not just two cultures, but we've got more silos that we want to bring together. So this is a huge, huge number of organizations, some very small, some large, that are trying to make this a better world. How to bring them together and how to get the artists, to, they, they don't do very well in communication and keeping up with, with what's happening. And uh, I, I still hope that the artists can help them. Well, that's that's uh, interesting that you see uh, hope for artists. That's good. <laughs> artists and engineers together. That's the way they should be. <laughs> and designers. <laughs> and you were in a science. And educators. Uh, science. And educators. educators have a big role in this because of your you're a little bit neutral from the commercial uh, interests that are pervading the technology at this point. A little bit neutral. A hundred percent. I think the, I just want to make one last little point, if that's okay. The, I think the interactive social nature of digital media, like I think our whole way of interacting the way we're doing currently at this time, how much of our lives are spent interacting digitally has changed the materiality of digital media. I think before it was more outside of us. I think more an external thing, as you see in the early works I did. But now I think it's become, I, I think it's really changed the materiality. And I'd like to see how, I, I'm, my question is more like, and this is just to myself or to every, anybody, how to touch or sense the fabric of our social lives and the impact of digital technology on that. And that's a, a thought I'm having, I'm thinking about these days about how what materiality, what's the sense of our social lives in this new mediated environment? And I, I think that's, um, it's, there's many aspects of that that is hard to parse out, but I'm looking at it. And that's one of the things I'm interested in right now. Which I think is why this, this symposium was really a good, good timing. You didn't do this thinking, knowing about this pandemic, but that we'd all be living on Zoom, but, um, I think your timing on this, this discussion is really pertinent to the times that we're in. Yeah, and, and also thinking how we're all situated in different places and all those different places have different regulations. So what might be very uh, oppressive to some or very isolated, others might have more, yes. more embodied relations. Um, and, um, you know, others might be in places where they just had to travel there and like locked up in a, um, place waiting to be able to move to where they want to move uh, and you know so um, it is very interesting so uh, it's always interesting to think that when we think about digital mediation and and how we live in interfaces not everyone has that same reality um, yeah. And, yeah. Uh, but, uh, yeah zoom is freeing us up to interact from different places like this yeah and then there's the 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 very um um, you know, great opportunity to be in different places at the same time yeah. with all these different people. <laughs> so yeah. that's the positive of it. Yeah. Positive. yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, so um, I don't know if there's any more thoughts. Um, uh, there's so much in your work, Elizabeth, that, uh, that needs to be addressed and uh, thought about I mean this uh, so many layers uh, of interesting things and how uh, through your through your work you can you can trace a path of development of technology but also of a very uh, committed interest to in thinking about our relation and how that you know manifests in our everyday lives uh, so I find it's really really interesting um, thank uh, you should we continue or, or um should we open it up for questions? Uh, I don't know what Theodora and Daniel uh, think. 
If there are any more questions from the audience, um, we, we could spend a few minutes on that, but, and then maybe uh, Daniel and I could have a few closing remarks, but um, there is no rush. I mean, <laughs> I don't know if anybody, uh, if there's more things we would like to discuss, we can do that. If we want to wrap this up, we can do that too. And um, I'm sure we'll have more opportunities in our fall exhibition to, to talk about yes. this work. Um, are there any questions from the audience? Reactions? Can, can you tell us a little bit about the plan for the exhibition um, maybe and how the, maybe perhaps how the work is gonna be displayed or your thoughts, Theodora and Daniel, or am I putting you on the spot? <laughs> um, Sure, we can. Maybe Daniel, do you want to take this? As uh, so, Daniel has been sort of. No, I think it's very, it's a very fair question <laughs> to quick update on the progress that you are. And I have been closely working together with the team at the Center de Design in Montreal. We have an amazing team of uh, project managers and designers we're working with. Um, and uh, they, I would say, the design of the space is. It's almost finalized and we're very excited about how the kind of the ideas and the themes that we have been discussing in the symposium and that are kind of structuring these conversations are also going to be represented in the space of the, of the gallery, which is a wonderful, for those of you who don't know it, it's a 4,000 square feet gallery right in downtown Montreal. So we're super excited about it and super excited about having uh, Lisa's work and the work of so many of the um, um, interlocutors that we've had in the, in the show. Um, yeah, that's kind of the, the quick update. The, there's a lot of detail in any direction. <laughs> that, oh, okay. but, but, but yeah, that's kind of the, the, the other thing that is very exciting to, to, to us is that along with the exhibition and the symposium, there's going to be a, a printed, um, Kind of catalog of the, of the of the show, but it's not just a catalog of the show. It's not just listing the the works. It's going to be sort of expanded with essays, as some of you know, um, uh, including many of the of the of the presentations that we saw in the symposium. They will become short essays in the in the catalog, and and we are playing with this idea of the catalog being a sort of uh, a recent expanded uh, catalog where. The focus is still on the visual. We're talking about the computation of image and, and that remains kind of a, an overarching theme. Um, and the texts come to enrich that and to, and to have that kind of discussion. And some of these conversations will, will also make it into the book. So we're, we're really excited and we're really, really grateful to all of the interlocutors, presenters uh, and audience who joined these three fantastic three days. Um, it's, been, it's been really wonderful. Thank you so much. It sounds amazing. Um, I was I was wondering more about how how uh, and if, I don't know if you want to talk about how videos are going to be displayed and um, and 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 I'm guessing I'm I'm I maybe I'll bring it back to Elizabeth a, a little bit about about this 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 relationship to sound. Um, and, and the emphasis on the visual and how can we think about that relationship um, and how in, in the symposium, the, the visual is, is, is super important, um, but then these, this transference between the sound and the visual and the electronic and the visual, like those, those kind of ephemeral things that are out there. Um, yeah, um, that's such an important question. And every every work of video has their own demands, right? And, yeah. and those are conversations that that uh, like Liz, along with Flora and myself and the team, the in the thing will kind of look in detail to make sure that we can get as close as possible to the specific materiality of the original piece. And the UCAM has a wonderful kind of collection of hardware, including historical hardware that I think we will be able to to mobilize to represent the work of, of, of Liz and others in the in the most kind of uh, powerful way. Yeah. I think the other uh, issue that's highly kind of specific to the pandemic situation with the exhibition is that this is a 
a show that, of course, um, it's a project that Daniel started at Carnegie Mellon a few years ago and which is now being expanded. So there were some thoughts about the expansion and we, we started working on it almost, what was it, uh, two years ago, a year and a half ago. And uh, since the pandemic started, it's, it's, it's been so kind of interesting to think about not only the scenography and the and the, how the specific pieces, because it's a large collection of pieces, there's more than 150 pieces that are being displayed in various formats, not only their sequencing, but, but constraints that have to do obviously with the changing situation. So um, obviously, as some of you know, the exhibition has pushed kind of um, forward, has been pushed forward a couple of times. And depending on when it was going to happen, we had very different constraints when it came to people even being able to put headphones on or touch something or, you know, be together kind of witnessing a piece. And anyway, we're hoping that September, being optimists, uh, we're hoping that in, in September we will be able to kind of gather in space and interact a little bit more freely uh, with, 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 the, with, the, with the pieces. But that's been also interesting. It's been a very... Um, rapidly changing and kind of volatile situation to kind of work through um, with many very particular challenges. Yes, of course. I, 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 I didn't think about that and how that is completely changing the way you're presenting the pieces. That's, that's, a, that's a very difficult challenge. Yeah, some of, some of the, the some of, some elements in the design of the exhibition are interactive reconstructions yeah. of, of software. <laughs> and well, while we were like, okay, so we're not gonna have reconstruction because no one will want to touch a screen or or like like turn a knob or, or something like that. Now we are kind of realizing that yeah, maybe we can do that. There's ways to do that, and there's there's also better understanding of what of the of the of the risks of, of touching uh, versus airborne contagion. So um, right now, the, the 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 shape that the exhibition is taking is 95% of a normal kind of exhibition. There will be some precautions, but I think it will be very safe to do all of that. Excellent. I mean, I guess this is almost uh, kind of going into our, our our closing remarks. We were. Uh, but maybe before we kind of officially um, kind of give our closing <laughs> remarks, maybe uh, we, we will thank you so much, uh, Elizabeth and Gabriela for this wonderful discussion. It's just been incredibly uh, thought provoking. I think there's many uh, comments in the chat that are also kind of acknowledging how incredibly rich uh, this afternoon was. I think it's a, it's a perfect way to kind of end, end this three day event. Um, and as Daniel said, this has been extremely stimulating for, for us as well. Um, uh, I mean, obviously you, you put a group of people together that you think are going to have kind of a good conversation and exchange ideas, but you can never anticipate the kinds of connections that will emerge. And so this has been truly fascinating uh, to see in the past few days. Um, our goal is we have been uh, recording everything. Our goal was really to, to come up with a form of documentation for the event using our website as, um, as a way to both um, kind of archive uh, some of what happened during the, during the meeting, but also um, compile a few resources. Olga suggested this morning that there's been a very lively situation in the chat with references, articles, ideas, um, possible starting points for new research. So, so Daniel and I will discuss if there's a good way to make that uh, accessible and available. Um, and also the videos, of course, with the consent of the presenters, we will discuss if there's a way to, again, make them available to the, to the public. Uh, Daniel, did you want to add anything to that or? No, I think, I think that's it. Yeah, the the... And maybe I'll just add a little thing there that, that a lot of these things will kind of take a, sh take a, a, a sort of stable shape in the book, right? I think we're, we're aiming at the, at the book becoming, the book and the website, the, the Lattice Space website, becoming these kind of homes for, for these conversations. 
And so, yes, in, in closing, we wanted to thank you all for, um, for joining us. It was wonderful to see so many of you come in and out throughout these three days and being so active in, in, in participating in the conversations. Um, we hope that you enjoyed it. We, we enjoyed it immensely, so we can, we can speak for ourselves. Um, I also wanted to thank very much our student assistant who has been uh, tirelessly making sure that everything is running um, during our Zoom make meeting. Maybe Elif, you can put your camera on. I don't know if you're here. Oh, hi, yes, you're there. Okay, wonderful. Um, and uh, also Max LeBlanc, I don't know if he already left, who has been, uh, he's also a student at McGill and he's been tweeting about our event. Um, Thank you, thank you both. We also wanted to thank again, um, obviously all of our panelists, speakers, chairs, moderators for the masterful presentations and masterful work that, that, that you did. And also again, a word of gratitude to uh, the School of Architecture at McGill University for supporting this event and the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada, as well as um, our uh, collaborators, uh, operative space, who designed our web platform, which will, will become a more permanent home for some of the conversations that we have been having here on Zoom. I'm doing the Oscars thing, which is like, oh, I'm forgetting anybody, but maybe maybe Daniel can tell me. And uh, no, I just mentioned that operative space is also designing the, the book and, and uh, yeah, we're so happy to have their vision as part of the project. And, and part of aspects of the exhibition are also designed in conjunction with them. So it's just... Oh, and maybe another thing to mention, we would love if you, I mean, obviously, if, if you um, agree to that, we would, we would uh, love to keep you updated with, uh, with next steps and the form that um, both the documentation of the symposium, but also the release of the book, the exhibition. Um, so we are also, uh, uh, planning, there's a few students and colleagues uh, who uh, will also be reporting on the event. So there will be some kind of more synthesizing critical essays on, on what happened that will also be, be published on our website in, in the next week or so. So we would love to keep you updated on that as well. And again, we do see that as a, as a node in a larger, in a larger um, kind of conversation and project, hopefully, and we would love to uh, keep you involved. Great. Wonderful. So I guess this officially closes it. And what we had in mind um, was to maybe for those of you who would like to stay and turn on your cameras, we could have a little happy hour perhaps. <laughs> I mean, maybe just kind of raise a glass um, or chat a little bit very informally. Um, without, the, without being live streamed or yes. recorded. <laughs> yes. So, so the symposium officially concludes now and we close the recording and live stream. Thank you, Les.